Welcome everyone to the show. Just waiting to see if everything's going to synchronize up on the screen. I see there's already a lot of chats going on in the chat section, so I'm going to get to them in a second. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. This was a bit of an impromptu stream tonight. I didn't actually have an idea about doing one today. And the thought just hit me about an hour ago. We're coming close to the end of the year. And why not just discuss what we've been wearing the most for the last year or over the last six months. So welcome everyone. I'm going to say hi to everyone in the chat at the moment. Watch up, Oliver, The Watch Lounge, David B, John, Mr. Anderson, Bud the Stud, Carl, welcome, Oliver, Carlos, nice to see you all. Welcome to the show. So this I'm thinking is going to be kind of like a, a running discussion where we can all sort of interact and I can bring up some pieces that you're going to be sharing. And it's going to be that idea of we all just discussing what we have been wearing the most this past year. And at the same time, for those of you who will be tuning in later or haven't seen this live, if you can jump into the comments and just share what you've been wearing this year, I think it would be cool. Since we're coming close to the end of the year, it would be nice to just kind of piece together what watches have really appealed to us. So it should be a lot of fun. Um, I'm just seeing some more names. MGMAs, welcome, Steve, PJ, French watches, nice to have you here. So it's going to be great. Uh, I thought it would be a nice, a nice change. It's been a, a busy weekend for me, actually, a busy day. The last few days have been crazy. In the back of my mind, I thought I'd just love to kick back and not do a stream tonight, but then thought, you know, it's the time of the year where we're all slowly but surely winding down. It's uh, We're all just coming to terms with everything ending. And next week i've got a really cool idea for a stream that we can also do coming you know as as the year comes to a close for new year and everything else welcome peter wong ray jimmy i'm going to just say your your first names just to speed up the process Lux, Lux watch collector welcome okay so i saw a mention about a tudor oops i always hit the wrong button let's get this guy up no not settings before we get into it I would just like to give a shout out to Dear Artifact. He is on Instagram and he's a really great little page. And he's been trying to promote his latest article that he's been writing all about his dream watch. And it's a really cool article. So what I'm going to do is uh, I can pull it up here. This is his Instagram page. So if any of you are on Instagram and his actual article is right here on his main page. What I'm going to do right now in the main chat is link his Instagram page for you to have a look at. Hold on a second. Uh, let's see, a little bit of a technical difficulty. So basically, my Grail watch that doesn't exist yet. And it's this really nice long discussion where he looks at all sorts of pieces from Oris, Tudor, really runs through the watches that he likes. And it's a lot of fun. So I'm going to drop in his Instagram feed here. That's his main Instagram feed. And this is his article, if you haven't seen it. Very cool. Uh, I haven't sat and, and read the whole thing entirely, but it is really nice just to see a different perspective. He looks at different brands and it was a lot of fun to page through. Highly recommend you do because it's it's nice and methodical. He looks at case studies. He like focuses on all sorts of little bits and pieces. So Dear Artifact on Instagram. I'm just catching up with everyone else in the chat as I scroll through here. Uh, we have Jimmy, we have Ian, uh, Bud, Clive, welcome, FD28, Jenks. Jeez, I have a lot of people joining. Thank you all for joining. So again, for those of you who are new, Crappy, welcome, Ray. We're going to keep this discussion based on just subjects relating to the watches that you've been wearing the most this year. And I can already see some mentions about uh, Breitling from Clive. That's a really sick piece. The 806 that's been touted as a really cool piece that's just arrived. Really nice. So this is how we're going to kind of riff tonight. And, you know, interaction is everything on the page. And I love this part of the live stream where we can just all sit back, chat about things that we want to, and look at various pieces from all walks of life. This week has been quite strange. I didn't expect to have two videos up, but I put up two one on the uh, the Sky Dweller the other day, yesterday, and earlier this week on FP Jean, I think, I think, and uh, it was really cool. Got some nice videos prepared over the next few weeks. 
So everyone, we have Maz, Howard, welcome, Double T, Ron the Shrink, welcome. Awesome, you have a one, I didn't know you had a, a no date sub, that is sick. Okay, this is cool. So where to begin? You see, this is the kind of the problem. Mentioning like everyone's watch is gonna be quite a slow and methodical process, but we can, you know, just, just banter about pieces that we like. Um, maybe it'll be good to start by just sort of highlighting what makes a great wearing watch. I, I looked at it and I thought, well, the Tudor GMT seems to be quite an aspirational piece for most people uh, because it's it's just so simple. And I think that kind of fits into the realms of being that sort of watch that you want to wear on a daily basis. Um, so there's there's a few things that you can sort of chalk up, but also is dependent on the time of the year and, and what's suiting you. As the season's changing now in the Northern Hemisphere, we're switching out to bracelets for some of us. Some of us are switching to NATO straps and leather straps because we're going into, I mean, it's officially the first day of winter. So, and I'm just popping some wine to start the show off. MGMA, so you got me wanting a chrono attack. <laughs> okay, well, I'll pull up what I've been wearing lately. The, the watches that really have pulled me comes as no real surprise. The, uh, the two pieces that have really caught my attention I'm a homage watch guy. I love vintage homage pieces. So these two have really been the ones that have that I've loved wearing and enjoying. So on the left, you have the Smith's Everest, which is what I'm wearing tonight. And on the right, Chrono Attack. Thanks to Last Watch Horology. He's also a, also has a channel on the platform. He uh, he loves making uh, I would say homage vintage pieces look even more old school. And I found the watch on his page and thought, hell, this has to be checked out because I have this fascination for the 1655. So they're both homage watches in their own category. I think they have their own separate approaches. I really I really dig the Smiths. It's one of those watches I just throw on. It's what I'm wearing tonight. Uh, simple. You can wear it anywhere. And uh, oh, it's just cool. Just enjoy it. So these two pieces have been the ones that I've been wearing the most. And this little Smiths has a domed sapphire crystal. It looks awesome in the light. This Chronotac has a boxed, or let's say a, a top hat acrylic. Uh, I'd love to put an ETA movement inside it and just wear the snot out of it. It's really got me thinking about what it would be like to own a 1655 one day. And it's one of these, this, this watch especially is one I just gravitate towards. I think it's so sick, but of course it's not up everyone's alley. Um, I, I'm a big fan of, design in the sense looking at aesthetics and everything else and for me at this point in my life i'm really just trying to like feel my way and just enjoy the hobby in a sense so having a 1655 homage next door to a 1016 really love the story behind the smiths being this watch that went up everest and paying tribute to the 1016 explorer in their own way it's pretty cool it's got a nice little background story so that's what i'm wearing tonight of course, nothing high horology, nothing over the top, as we know. Um, it's the worst position to be in because I'm so keen to get a really high-end piece. I actually have enough money saved to get a really high-end piece, but I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm just going to hold out a bit more, just a bit more and see what's coming because it's, it's kind of like you spend all this time writing about these pieces, you get some hands-on time with some ridiculous pieces, and then it just throws you for a loop, you know? Um, Carl Lehman asked me a question about, uh, am I still in love with the Parnas Panda chronograph? I really enjoy it. Um, I've got the just the standard white dial with the, the black ceramic. I've thrown it on a Jubilee bracelet. I wear it very seldomly, actually. I don't wear it much anymore. I don't know. It's, it's crazy how the simpler watches seem to get more wrist time for me. Um, and I guess we can sort of tie in that whole relationship in this discussion. It's kind it's, it's very important, I think, when it comes to just day-to-day -day wearing. You don't really want a watch that pulls a lot of attention. You kind of want something understated that's practical and uh, it'll be a nice discussion to have. So that's basically, I think the first half an hour of the stream, we can really run through that and focus on the watches that really speak to all of us as great understated wearing pieces. Um, Peter Wong says, patience. Yeah, I, I'm trying to be as patient as possible. And it's it's paying off because I mean, the money is being saved. It's going towards other things. But there's always a little bit on the side that I'm really thinking about putting into something great. It's the worst position for me to be in because I'm just writing about all these crazy things. And 
it's so hard to pull a thought together. It's, it's hard enough thinking about the perfect watch that you'd want to own one day, but then it's thinking, in my case, it's thinking about what would be an excellent watch to get as a first high-end luxury piece, you know? Um, M Technic, welcome. I see there was a question. I've been wearing my Seamaster 300. Awesome. It's, there's so many watches we can pull up. As, as I'm chatting, I'm just going to pull up some pieces. Uh, pulled up the 1016, opened a few tabs before the, the channel started earlier. I thought it would be, be nice to just browse through the watches. I see Ron the Shrink asking me a question. Uh, dead on about the 1016 and 1655 being two of the best. They're very interesting watches. It's, but, of course, it is up to personal preference. I mean, the other day I wrote about the Skydweller. And the Rolex Skydweller, this was a video I put up uh, like yesterday. When It's a watch that I've had lots of reservations about because it's, it's quite brash and in your face in a way. But in saying that, just the complication and the, the sheer attention to detail, it has all the Rolex DNA. It's got a super high-end complication, and it would appeal to a lot of people as an everyday wearing complication. Uh, Curtis is a follower of the channel. He sent me an email yesterday. I still haven't read it. I've actually been out of the house all day today. Uh, he wears a Skydweller, and he's an aviation pilot. And he says it's the best thing ever as his years are, are getting on. He just enjoys the variety, the, the factor that it stands out so well and that it's usable, having all of these complications and everything to, ah, oh, it's just awesome. It's a really sick watch. It's not something that appeals to me. I think as, as you sort of mature in this space and you start learning more and appreciating things more, you can start saying more and more often, it's not something that will appeal to me 100%. It's not something that I would possibly go for. But at the same time, you can understand where it's where it's sitting and what value it offers in the various areas. Just trying to get a nice picture. I love the blue dial on this piece. I think it is absolutely superb. So yeah, getting back to Ron and the, the 1016 and 1655, they they really do offer something else. Very understated, low-key factor. Uh, they don't look like Rolexes to the everyday person, which means you can get away with murder, you know? Um, really do it. Get a longer one, Maz says. <laughs> that would be awesome. A longer one is not a watch that really appeals to me, uh, honestly. I love it. I think it's just the thought process behind it is fantastic, but asymmetry is not something that really pulls me. But again, preferences change depending on age and maturity and everything else. Uh, there was a mention about a P01 by Zenix Media. This watch has received a lot of flack and a lot of just taste by the majority of the community. My like underlying mention I say about this piece is um, I love the fact that it's Tudor experimenting with ideas. It's Tudor thinking about how they will approach the brief. I mean, of course, this is a reissue of a 60s model, but the fact that they're, they're willing to go and make a production model of a prototype means to say that they're being creative in a way. And I think that's awesome. Um, and also the combination is great. I've seen this watch on a on a Black Bay bracelet, rivet style bracelet. It looks so, so sick. So it really is always up to personal preference. JLC Geophysic. Um, M Technic, I'm, you know, if I was getting a JLC at this point in time, the two watches that really appeal to me, the one that I would probably jump on is the JLC Sector Chronograph. Something about this that always pulls me back. It's Modern, retro, sleek, understated. Is that a good enough picture? I don't know. The sector standard piece is, it doesn't appeal to me anywhere near as much as the chronograph. I don't know. I think it's the symmetry that I like. Love the, love the simplicity. Sector dials. If we go into Longines and everything, oh, we can chat about that in a second. So everyone, welcome. Again, Oliver, wristwatch experience. Steve, uh, Hardy from Texas, Derek. This is cool. There's so many, of course, there's so many chats going on. I'm having to catch up, but we will get there eventually. And uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Rolex Sea Dweller 43, Daily Wearer from David. Uh, I, th I think I mentioned this briefly in the last stream, that the 43 mil, I had time wearing. And uh, all I can say is, before you make a judgment on this watch, because often you see it looks way, I mean, here's a perfect example. It looks way too big on the wrist. <clears throat> really try and wear it first because you might be surprised. Now this watch was oversized for me and it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, the Sea Dweller is just a 
stellar, stellar watch. Uh, the 43, what's great about it is the proportions have been thought about everywhere. The width of the lugs, the dial size, the, the numerals, the plots, the, the fully graduated bezel, what's not to like? Well, the Cyclops lens, I guess. But uh, it's superb. As an everyday wearing watch, you can't go wrong. And I think we can refer back to the whole thought about how understated you want the watch to be as an everyday wearer. I think that's important. And we gravitate towards that often more often than we think. And then we might want to spice it up with a different strap or bracelet or whatever else. I'm just seeing some more. Again, if you'd like me to answer your question a little bit faster, tag me at IDGuy if you have a question or a statement about a certain watch and I'll pull it up. Um, I'm having to scroll through a lot of these and it will be nice if you guys can just keep chatting in the chats as always and it'll make the thing, it'll just, the stream flow a bit quicker. It is a woman's wrist, yeah, BS. It's, it's insane, I mean, the watch looks huge. It can be the same on guys' wrists as well. And I don't know, I think what, what happened to me was wearing it, trying it on. Everyone said it looked fine on the wrist, but you see it yourself. You know, when you, when you look down at it and, and it doesn't seem to fit as neatly as you would like. Uh, yeah. And then this piece, I don't, I don't know what they were thinking with the two-tone sea dweller. It's like they really want to jab you in the eye and say, you know, we're making this thing two-tone. I mean, the sea dweller is supposed to be this top of the range hyper sports diver, and then they make a two-tone, you know. LLD is asking me if I'm wearing pants. I am. I'm wearing a Nike track pants. Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> and do I have curtains, Dan? I have blinds, really cool blinds. So, yeah, uh, I do have curtains and blinds, actually. It's really cool. Um, Blancpain 50 Fathoms Flyback Chrono from the Watch Lounge. This watch we've chatted about a lot, and actually... It's going to be a watch that uh, is going to be mentioned. I'm just going to call it the Air Command, because that's the name. It's a watch that's going to be discussed in a new video that I've been working on over the last week. It's going to be a bit of a surprise video, if you know the history. And we've, we've chatted about military watches before. We're going to go in depth into a different category. So should be awesome. Blue Shirt, welcome, Dan. I haven't seen you guys. Welcome to the show. I, I've been just scrolling around. Uh, I see Werner is asking, waiting two months now for my Longines Heritage Sector Dial. Bought purely on emotion. Yeah, it is so cool. And you're asking what whiskey I'm drinking. I had a very bland blend before, and now I'm drinking a Merlot, or the more cultured people would say Merlot. Uh, so we're going to pull up the Longines quickly. Love the air command, by the way. Uh, Longine Heritage Classic, they call it. This watch has gotten all the attention, and like it's it's problem when when I have a page like this and I can discuss watches at you know, willy nilly. Uh, what happens is the demand goes up for them all of a sudden. I mean, there's there's a hundred people watching right now, and if this watch speaks to you, then there are a hundred more pre-orders, and so it goes. Uh, this piece has really caught my attention. I think what Longines has been doing with their most recent watches, like their their heritage, their big eyes, and all these uh, inspired from the 40s and the 60s pieces, mm, I really dig it. I'm big on the the heritage homage stuff. You can uh, you can count that against me, but it's something that I really enjoy. I kind of like that motif, um, having handled a Omega from 1938 that shared a dial with Longines. They really are big watches. They're not small. I mean, this I think this piece measures to be 38 mils. There is a lot of open space. So you must consider that if your wrist is average. Uh, you're going to be dealing with a lot of negative space, but it is stunning. I, I think just the 3, 6, 3, 6 9, 12, the, the layout, the simpleness of the, the pencil hands, it's so neat and clean, and I love it. It's so cool. But, of course, uh, you know, the more I share and the more I say how cool it is, so the demand is going to drive up, and uh, these watches are going to become less and less available for everyone else. Um, awesome. I suggested there was, there was a Longines Big Eye chronograph. I'm just going to pull that quick. By the way, these are all watches that make excellent you know, everyday wearing pieces, which is what I kind of like about this. There's a question about the Carl Bashir. I'm going to have a look at that right now. Uh, Longines Chronograph, pull up the big eye. I think it's the big eye. This watch was on eBay in the UK for just over a thousand pounds. And I was, my finger was itching to buy it. 
I was so, so close. And I decided, no, the money's probably going towards rent at the end of the month and thought, no, put it aside. I went on the stream yes, uh, earlier this week, well, last week, sorry, and promoted it. Checked eBay a couple of hours later and it was gone. So it just goes to show, like, the, the guy is always watching, you know, always hunting and waiting. Uh, I dig this thing. The, so the, the write-up that I'm basing the whole discussion on is going to be on this piece and it's going to be stellar. It's going to be so cool. Uh, watches like this, chronographs, and uh, I won't give it all away. I'll give you a I'll give you a hint at a later stage. There was a question about the, the Oris Carbrasher non-chrono. So I'm guessing it is the uh, the bronze, uh, and it's so what is what is the make against Oris? Okay, non-chrono. <clears throat> so it has a blue dial, I, I guess. I I've, I know the Carbrasher, but I don't know the exact model. And I'm guessing it's just the standard. Yeah, so I have a, if we talk about, oh, geez, don't tell me, this is 2,000, you know, pixels, and it's in low res. Let's pull up something good, something on the wrist, anything. Of course, the chronograph is what gets the best res images. I love it. I have a huge reservation with brass, oh, sorry, bronze as a material. Oh, geez, why aren't there any standard pieces? Should I say non-chrono? Maybe that'll help. Sorry, be with me, guys non-chrono and i'm sure it's just going to keep giving me chronos uh i'm just going to have to pull up a chrono it's very similar it's just a bit cleaner so i like the cleanliness of the watch if we just refer back to the, the standard diver the standard diver just won't have a chrono complication it's just clean all the way through but the material if i'm correct in saying that this is a bronze case i just i just think bronze on a watch is um, it's ludicrous honestly um I don't want to bash anyone who does like bronze. It's a nice finish. But when you're dealing with materials, you know, it, my, my game, industrial design, is all about dealing with materials. Why is there no, oh, this will have to do. Sorry, I can't get the, the, the proper, uh, the no chrono version. Doesn't seem like any very good high res images. When you're dealing with materials, it's important to understand that it's being worn on the wrist. Now we know bronze was a material used for dive helmets and everything else back in the day. And we know that it corrodes. It oxidizes like there's no tomorrow. So it's, it just doesn't make sense to me why you would choose a material like that. Unless you like the patina effect, you like the finish, uh, that's what's one reason. But when you think about just how, it's, it's a joke and it's very like ironic to say that stainless steel is a great, but it is a great material. Gold is a terrific material because it's so inert. Uh, it doesn't get affected by all these elements. When you're dealing with a material that is going to rust and oxidize at an insane level, depending on whether you expose it to salt water and all the rest, can be a real, it's, it's, it defeats the, the wearability of the piece. It doesn't make it aesthetically appealing, in my opinion. I mean, the, the green's cool, but if you want to say that you're wearing rust, that's something. If you, if you like the smell of rust, if you like the stain it leaves on your skin, it's fantastic, but uh, there, there's there's patina and then there's this. I don't know if I can pull up an example of just, uh, what should I say, bronze watch, and we can have a look at just examples of what happens. Like, uh, can we some high-res images, please? Please, Google. Here's an example. Now, you see it you see it in the photos you see this beautiful finish and you think okay it looks great but then you see what happens when it gets corroded by salt water i mean this if you just leave this out, outside your house for i don't know a couple of months in the winter the watch will look like this <laughs> it looks like it's been buried underground at the end of the second world war so it's an aesthetic that i really do not understand that's i think that's the the best way i could explain it it's nothing that appeals to me. Again, referring back to industrial design, it's all about making things convenient, usable, practical. And for me, having a watch that does this over time, unless you clean it and maintain it, just doesn't make any sense. So that's my uh, my two cents, DB. I don't know if it's uh, if it's helped you at all. Uh, I'm, I mainly bash the material itself. I mean, the, the actual watch, simple dive watch works great. Oris makes some awesome stuff. Love some of their divers. I think the 65 is a really sick piece. Love the, love the overall size. 
what I do find interesting is that the, the modern, this, this newer incarnation has a, a bronze bezel uh, grip, if I'm not mistaken. And that's about it. That's quite nice. But just in general, the material itself, I, it oh, gets on my nerves. <laughs> that's what I can say. Um, okay. I've missed a lot of these chats. And uh, yeah, I've just gone on a tirade about Dear Artifact. I just mentioned you in the beginning of the stream about your page and everything else. Um, so I've just been going on a tirade at telling, telling you about how much I hate bronze on a watch just because the material is it's not good. Why do you have reservations on bronze case? Yeah, so I've just tried it. I've tried to explain it, David. It's just because it corrodes and it's as a practical wearing material. I don't think it's it's as good. I mean, something as simple as steel. It's ridiculous to say steel is a good material because it's just everywhere, but it stainless steel is a fantastic material. It's cheap. It's available, of course. Uh, it's not as flashy. Bronze is cool when it's not corroded, but you know whether you like it or not, the watch is going to corrode, which is even worse. You can say, oh, I love the two-tone aesthetic. I think it's great. But then you will just notice a week later after wearing it and you've sweated a little bit, and you've, you know, operating the bezel, you've sweated as you've been adjusting the bezel, and then you notice there's rust on it. And then you have to get alcohol and you have to try and get it off, and it's pain in the ass. I'll say that much. Okay, dear artifact, thoughts on the Amiga Railmaster 1957. Sorry, guys, I've missed a lot of your chats. I'm just going to try and keep up with the more recent stuff if I can. I don't know how long the stream's going to be tonight, but uh, we'll see how it goes. The Railmaster 1957, I was a little bit, you know, it's, it's a very simple watch, very plain. Didn't know what I would think about it until I saw a 1958 Railmaster in the flesh with a lollipop second hand. And honestly, wearing a Lunga and wearing this watch, they were the two that really sold me that night. Uh, I think the size is superb. I don't know about this model, but the one I wore was, I think, also 38, 39 mils. It was quite big. Uh, had a had a lollipop second hand right on the right on the edge, and there's something about just the way they've executed the dials. These these pieces, these trilogy watches that Amiga has done is superb. Um, th these would be the top contenders for me if I'm looking for a watch at this point in time. Uh, talking about the one watch that I would wear the most, these pieces, this and the the Seamaster 357. <sighs> yeah, that would be me. I'm so so down. And I think they just they just nailed it. You know, putting a watch in an MRI machine again. We're going back to these heritage inspired homage pieces, but they look terrific. Um, okay, I see Peter Wong saying that he that he likes the Tudor Black Bear bronze. Of course, I mean it's it's all up to personal preference. I just as a material, I find bronze just bizarre. It's nice that you get that two tone finish, but uh, it's, it's that it's that effect that you get over time. Um, you know, sweat in the tropics, as Harry says, will destroy it in no time. It'll it'll just ugh, just get to my nerves. Uh, where Eagles Dare talking about yeah Bugsy Malone, awesome film, love it. Uh, OCD, yeah, that's a that's a one bronze shiny. I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom and see what else there is. Uh, Zodiac, Cheetown, welcome. There's a couple of guys I haven't met. There's Thomas, welcome Thomas. I saw a fat email from Thomas earlier that he sent me. We love sending like essays to each other over time, so it's really <laughs> it's really cool. Um, Dan is asking a question about the Planet Ocean 42 mil. I'm just going to type in the reference. That might be easier. Uh, Omega. And again, please stick to this, this. Stick to the subject of watches that we have been wearing the most this year. As most of you might know, the Smiths Everest has been for me. It's what I've been wearing all the time. So this is the 42 mil, and this is the first generation, the original Planet Ocean. Honestly, I'm a little bit on the fence with the Planet Ocean line. I think it's it's actually a very bold move. Actually, no, I take that back. It's a very bold move to introduce a watch like this in tandem with the Seamaster. I think it pays much better tribute to the original Seamasters. Love the, the way they've balanced out the dial with the numerals and everything else. Love the hands. Um, 42 mils as a size. It's great. I mean, when, when I look at the original piece, I see a lot of negative space in the dial. So that could make the watch look a lot bigger on the wrist. Um, the one watch that really pulled me was the 39 millimeter variant. And I don't know what it's called, but I'll just say 39. I think it's 39.5. I don't know. There's this, 
in the back of my mind, there's always a thought about just tightness. It's about bringing everything together a little bit neater. And if I was on the planet ocean train and I was keen, it is already quite a heavy built watch. You know, it presents itself as quite a heavy looking object. Even here, this watch looks like it's, it's 41 in size, you know. Um, but this is 39 and a half with a ceramic bezel. Looks a lot more contained. You see how the logo and everything has been set on the dial much tighter in proportions. The, you can see the batons have been elongated a bit more. The hands have been shortened. And um, I don't know, just my, my stupid pedantic mind always seeks for that compactness. I want to see everything pushed together as much as possible. So the space is utilized the most. Um, but of course, you want a bigger wearing watch? No problem. Here is a 39.5 against a 43. Sorry about the screen glitch there. 43 mil versus 39.5. There's a big difference. And there we go. There's a good example of just seeing how the space has been used dif differently. The baton size relative to the dial and just the sheer amount of open space. Hell, it's all up to your personal preference at the end of the day, you know. Um, Brasso is your friend. There's a mention from MGMA. Yeah. I mean, I love Brasso as it is, but having to use it on my watch every other day, mm, not cool. Uh, Zodiac Super Seawolf. Nice, Chi Town. Very, very sick. Um, that's cool. I'm kind of I'm kind of keeping up with the chats tonight, I think. Probably not. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, but again, I want to try my best to keep this this chat focused on watches that we've all been wearing often, you know, the, the watch we've been wearing the most. And I think just to circle back to that again, since the stream's been going on for half an hour, we can talk about just what it kind of means. What do you want from a watch in that sense? I mean, the Speedmaster is a great suggestion. Uh, there was a Speedmaster GMT. That's a bit hardcore. Let's just pull up a Speedmaster Amiga. So it's a watch that's very just quintessential for the brand at this point. But it also is, it, it ticks all the boxes with regards to being understated enough, simple. Um, here's a 41 and a half mil piece. <laughs> Another, I'm going to try and stay away from these heritage inspired pieces because it's just going to drive everyone nuts, I think. It's another one of those watches that you can wear every day and it has what you would like, sans water resistance and everything else. Anyway, um, there's a question about a show pod from Crappy Luxury. I'll get, to, I'll get to the more complicated stuff. I really want to try and keep to, I want to try and keep to the basic things if we can, because I think it's a great question. And as always, please share your stuff, share, share your comments about the watches that you have been wearing this past year. It'd be nice to hear. And of course, everyone else, this is an interaction part of the stream. So I love it when we can all just catch up. Blue Shirt says uh, he got his Explorer 2, Polar Explorer in May, wears it almost every day. And I think that's that's kind of the thing, you know, uh, 42. That's kind of the thing. It's, it's almost like you are drawn to wearing the piece. Here's an example of a 42 next to a 40. They look quite similar, right? It's pretty impressive. Let's see if I can find a nice full screen of the watch on the wrist. This is from a blog to watch. Now, again, the size, uh, another thing that's important to highlight is that if you do have a smaller wrist, white dials generally tend to scale up the visual presence on the wrist. So as this watch is 42 on a smaller wrist, it might even wear like a 44 for some. Um, but it's it's that that whole attraction. I think Blue Shirt kind of hit it on the head that it's a watch that, the, the watch that you tend to wear the most is a watch that you can open up in a watch box and you kind of, you don't ever say, nah, I'll choose something else. It's always the one you sort of gravitate towards for most occasions whether it's going out for walks, going to the gym, going out to work, whatever else. I think that's really the, the key focus on the piece. And that's ah, cool. I'd love to see this watch on an on a orange strap matching up with the, the orange hand. It would be awesome. Rolex Milgas for Jimmy. Um, uh, hate the bezel on the Planet Ocean. Yeah, the Planet Ocean bezel for me as well, Ron, it's, it's, it depends on the model too. We can we can chat about that in more detail in a second. Founder time is capitals on seventy three math. Welcome everyone. Great to have you here. Again, keeping to the theme, what watch have you been wearing the most? Discuss. <laughs> um, and talking about Christmas, I thought this would be like a cool time to have a Christmas themed uh, stream, but then this idea just hit me about an hour before the the stream started to just talk about 
daily wearers? What 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 watch works in most situations? And what you mean, what do you mean wearing the most? So I think the sub is great. I actually saw a guy wearing one today. It's just one of those pieces that just flies under the radar unless you know what you're looking at. These original five-digit references were creme de la creme, awesome. Okay, again, if you'd like me to get your question or your, your mention about the piece, I will um, I'll be able to reply better if you tag me at IDGuy in the chat. It'll be a bit easier to catch you. Um, so I see some mention about Datejust, Seiko. That's another thing. Seikos are great pieces for every day, whether it's snowflakes or whether it's down to the more, the SARBs. It's also another thing we can sort of cover is just whether or not sports watches fit our aesthetics more than the dress pieces. Uh, where's another good example? What's a good example of a dress watch that we can pull up? Um, let's do a Seiko presage, say, okay, or a Seiko cocktail time or whatever else. How many people wear dress styled watches on a daily basis? It's a very interesting thing. It's, it's one of those questions we always seem to ask is what kind of field do you fall into? What is your aesthetic? We all love the, we all love the idea of a watch that's waterproof that you can smash against the wall and everything else. We, we treat the dress watches for the more formal occasions. And uh, it's strange because that whole idea has sort of only been around for the last, I don't know what, 30, 40 years, 50 years maybe. Um, I see a few questions aimed to me. Uh, DB, I guess you're just uh, talking about bronze again. Not the best material for a chrono. Yeah. Uh, so DB, I will I will try and pull up a better reference for this piece. Let's try and find it. Proportions-wise, I think Aris does a great job with most of their pieces. Um, just in general, when we look at uh, where is it? You see, once again, there are no good examples. I mean, here is an example. Yeah, that's cool. Proportions-wise, I think Aris does a great job. Size, just scaling it down ever so slightly. We all have this kind of idea that we think brands are going to be tapering down the sizes of their pieces over time. Now that this uh, large watch uh, appeal seems to be shrinking a little bit. Um, so we, we don't know. Next year, we might see smaller scaled watches. I think it's nice that we're sort of getting the in-between. Don't necessarily have to get 36 mil, but why not 38? Why not 39 for a change, you know? Um, what else is going on here? Regular wear is a Casio PJ. That's cool. I have never discussed Casio on this page, and I think I should. It's not a watch that I've ever worn in my life. I, I started with, with swatches back in the day. Really sick little swatches. And I mean, Casio is, you know, it's, it's a watch of of the 80s. It's one of those pieces that really did stand out in the time. I'd love to do a bit of a historical analysis of it, and it would be cool. Uh, Michael S. is asking, uh, what are your thoughts on two-tone Rolex as a daily? Hmm. It is up once again. I think skin tone also plays a, f a factor in the whole process. 16713 on a Jubilee. Oh, geez, of course, this is our beautiful little tobacco. Love the bleach bezel. So it's, it's difficult to say. Uh, for When I think of a great wearing piece, a modern wearing two-tone, I immediately jump to the the modern Rolex root beer. I'm just going to say modern root beer, and maybe I'll get an answer. Um, pref just primarily because of the rose gold finish. I think rose gold on the the case on the bracelet seems to work better on more skin tones. Yellow yellow gold is cool, but it works on certain skins better than others. I see. I'm again. I'm kind of generalizing. It all depends on who you are and uh, what your skin color is like. I think rose gold is a lot more subdued. It's a color that you can get away with a lot. Uh, yellow gold, I don't know, it's it's crazy how the assumption changes. Wearing a, a, a rose gold, it looks a lot more casual, a lot more toned down. When all of a sudden someone's wearing a, uh, a full yellow gold, like like Jimmy Split. Jimmy Split has a, a great channel. You need to check out his page. I'll actually link it here in the chat right now. Jimmy Split 77, I think it is. It's 1T. Check out his channel on YouTube. Um, I really dig this. I think this combo just works so nicely for the Daytona. 
if I was wanting a two-tone tape, I can't speak tonight. If I was wanting a two-tone Daytona, this would be the one I would gravitate towards. He's, he just made a discussion about yellow gold on his GMT. He bought a full yellow gold piece. And the assumption that comes affiliated to these watches, it's, it's a sad thing, but yellow gold seems to attract a different audience to rose gold just because it's a little bit more understated. You can kind of mistake the rose gold just for a polish, you know, on the surface, which is really nice. I really like that idea, like that feature to the watch. So uh, it all depends on skin color, once again. That's my uh, <laughs> my basic answer, Michael. But but really, if, if you dig yellow gold, two-tone, killer. I mean, the original Pepsi, I, I mean, the original root beer, I got rid of, but um, on the on the screen. But it is all up to personal preference at the end of the day. I don't know so much about yellow gold, gold in general being very versatile, especially the older references, since it might stretch over time. And uh, yeah, okay, I've got to scroll up again and catch up with a bit more. Just bought a Black Bear 58 from Dustin. We're going to pull that up now in a second. Omega Seamaster 300 from Kamal. Welcome, everyone. I know you guys are, you seem like a lot of new guys to the stream. It's great to have you all here. Thank you so much for joining. So, uh, let's see what's a good example. Seamaster 300, and I'm guessing it's the new piece. It's a watch we've chatted about a lot. Uh, There's some watches that sort of seem to look a lot better than others, depending on your preference. Uh, generally, that you you want you kind of want the Seamaster to have the blue dial. Black dial is just great, nice and toned down. But if you want the real character of the watch, you want it in a blue dial format. This piece, the Chronograph really does something to me. I don't know what it is. I'm, you know, as much as we talk about perfection, quote unquote, with watches and design, sometimes the quirky stuff can pull you in. And I think this is pretty sick. Something about a diving chrono that, that fascinates me. Um, okay, I see a question so from Dustin, talking about the Black Bear 58. The reason why I used the, um, the, the GMT as a reference, the Black Bear GMT for the stream tonight, partially because it's very recognizable, but also because it sort of hit me thinking about what would make a watch that people would wear a lot on a day-to-day -day basis. Black Bear 58, it's a stellar watch. And we talked, I made a, did a stream a couple of weeks ago talking about uh, vintage inspired watches. And the basis of that stream was, if you hate vintage inspired watches that seem to just be everywhere nowadays, you can't really say you hate them and then look at Tudor and say, well, I really love Tudor because they've built their entire business model on the idea of heritage and vintage inspired Rolex pieces. So it's, it's pretty cool. I kind of like the approach and um, it's a stellar piece. I mean, who are we, who are we kidding? The fact that they've gone in-house and they've really tightened up their, their thinking with regards to the movements and, and the, finishing and the bracelet design and everything else it's awesome really like it um i'm just catching with everyone else on the stream chatting about the root beer thoughts on the rolex cellini i made a video maybe about six months ago on the piece uh uh from enzo thank you for the question enzo i made a video about the cellini a while ago i can't even remember what i what i said about the piece um i I really can't, what, what did I say? Maybe if I see it again and have a think. So what really grabbed me about the watch when just checking it out in more detail, again, it's kind of like the Sky Dweller in a way because it, it hits you in a, different, in a different tone as opposed to general pieces. Um, what I like that they've done so well is just integrate the numerals inside the batons. It's a very simple approach, but just thinking about where the minute track is set, and the fact that the dial architecture is used up so well. Notice the amount of negative space. They seem to have really pulled it in tighter. Now, with regards to Rolex being a watch that we have all affiliated to waterproofness and robustness, um, I don't even know if these watches are waterproof. I don't, they, they do have screw down crowns, but I don't know. Uh, I think it's, it's quite a charming watch. I, it, it makes quite a statement, actually. When you're someone who, knows a lot about watches, knows a lot about Rolex and everything else. You rock up wearing a Cellini, the enthusiast will kind of say, hey, that's pretty cool because you're not just wearing a steel sports watch. You, you kind of get the, the idea 
of what Rolex is trying to do, but at the same time, you like the idea of this different approach. The fact that Rolex went back to dress watches is a very bold move, actually. I think that's how I kind of worded it in the beginning. Also makes an excellent everyday wearing piece. But of course, it's, it's a watch that they brought out, and I don't think they had the intention that the watch would be a top seller. I mean, they, they kind of did it because they, they wanted to prove that they could with all the other brands. Um, I can't remember the extent of the video. It was, it was a long time ago. It was a good six or seven months ago when I was you know, recording in a cupboard trying to work out how to get the audio right and everything else. Um, so uh, Founders Timeless Capital says, I uh, love Jimmy. Yeah, he's awesome. He's really cool. He, he says it as it is. He's a legend, really. I tried to promote his page, I think about a year ago, just saying how cool his stuff was. He really needs more people to check him out. So Jimmy split 77. Um, really have a look at his page because he has a, it's a stellar vintage collection, uh, APs. He's got the whole deal and a really down to earth guy and awesome. So Ron the Shrink is asking, what skin color is the best? <laughs> ah, very good. Um, got a Zen 104 from Raymond. Rich buddy, welcome to the show. Uh, let's see, I'm going to try and catch up with the rest of the chats. Okay, what I'm going to do is only really focus on the comments that have my name tagged to them, I think, to just save us some time. Uh, it might be quite cool. Can a diving chrono be operated underwater if it's not in use from Enzo? Depending on the model, I do know that these pieces can. These Seamasters, the latest models, they've got all sorts of, of new gaskets that they've integrated into their helium release valves so that they can be operated underwater. And I think it's quite useless <laughs> if you have a diving chrono that can't be used underwater. I am almost 100% sure that they have incorporated gaskets to use the chrono underwater as it is. I think what grabs me, let me try and find a, a real close-up of the piece. Uh, let's see, chrono. What really pulls me in and what I like about it so much, maybe this is a better example. Hmm. Nice high-res image. Let's find one. Here we go. Here's a nice like contrast. What I really like is the usage of the subdials on this piece. I like the fact that it's two sets of subdials. It's nice and balanced. But more than that, seeing just how the hands have been used on the subdial. I, I can't exactly understand how it works <laughs> entirely. I'm guessing that the uh, this large hand counts half an hour increments, and the main hand counts every hour. So it's, it's a nice idea of incorporating both dials into one. Again, it's, it's cool watchmaking. Amiga does some sick stuff. They, they put a lot of thinking into these little bits and pieces. And for that reason, it's one of those elements that I really find interesting. So once you reset it, these hands both go to center. Uh, one hand will be used to count down the 30-minute scale or the hour. And the, the other hand would, you know, depending on what hour you're at, would, would calculate that as well. Really nice approach, nice and streamlined. There's something about it that speaks to me. It's definitely not to anyone's taste. I mean, hell, I like the, the JLC master compressor line a lot. So uh, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Um, oh, geez, I'm a super chat. Guys, thank you. Jeez, Mr. Perpetual. Okay, I'm going to roll back and just catch up with everyone. Mr. Perpetual, thank you so much for the super chat. You're asking me about Omega Seamaster GMT, Planet Ocean Titanium from Joma, which is 40% of retail. Good, good buy if I plan on keeping it. I understand Joma. So I'm not the, Mr. Perpetual, I'm definitely not the best person to ask about selling and resale and prices. There are so many good channels about it, uh, talking about these subjects, percentages and everything else. I'll pull up the Planet Ocean Titanium uh, GMT. We can have a look at it together. Uh, where's an example? The blue with a rubber strap or does it just have a standard? I'm guessing it's this piece, one of these pieces. I think what they've really nailed well, I, this actually, when since we've been talking about Planet Oceans earlier, what they've really nailed well on this piece is just the way they've set the bezel and they've highlighted the accents in the right place. One thing that I really didn't like about the Planet Ocean originally was when they highlighted the, the numerals in orange. I didn't think that worked as well as being able to just highlight the spot colors on the GMT hand, on the second hand, highlighting that it is a GMT. It's very nice, subtle, understated. Mr. Perpetual, I think it's a sick watch. I don't know if this is a recent piece. Um, that's a 600, so I'm guessing it is quite a modern piece. You can't go wrong with one of these watches, depending on, on what you want to use it for, depending on the, the environment. Here's another example. This reference has orange throughout the bezel. 
I don't know if that works as well. That's a little bit too aggressive visually, but still, uh, we're talking about prices. Be nice if anyone could answer Mr. Perpetual's question. Five thousand dollars from Joma Shop, which is fifty percent off retail. Sounds like quite a good deal to me because I mean it is awesome. I'm sure this is one of the most recent references. We were chatting about Planet Oceans earlier. Um, Ron the Shrink. Thoughts on reissuing Tritium instead of Fotina? Thank you so much for the super chat, Ron. You know that there are brands that have used Tritium in their pieces like Glycine, if I'm not mistaken. There are a couple of brands. I think I'll just type in Tritium and I'm sure there's something. I'm just off the top of my head thinking about it. I think Glycine is one of the brands. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, the reality is, Ron, if we put our thoughts into a more like industrial focused point of view, um, just, just design and, and materials built for long lasting appeal. The, the nice thing, what I really enjoy about watches in general is the fact that they are designed around long lasting elements. They're not designed around obsolescence. Now, when we consider tritium as opposed to Fotina or Superluminova, tritium is an awesome material. It doesn't need to be uh, serviced or anything for as long as its half-life remains. But it is also, quote unquote, volatile. And at the same time, it is going to die and fade eventually. So when you're looking at it from a more long lasting approach, any kind of company would say, we want to keep this material lasting forever. We don't want it to fade. Uh, I guess, and you know, tritium for most of us now would be something that appeals. It's, it's a material that would appeal to the more enthusiast side of the spectrum, people who enjoy tritium on their watches. I wouldn't say it's the majority. Uh, for us hobbyists, we might enjoy it, and I'm sure some brands would like to experiment. But in general, it's, uh, it's difficult to say if a brand would really focus on bringing back tritium. Great question, very nice question. Um, we all love the fade and, and everything else. So, I mean, it, it's just sick. And Neo, thank you so much for the super chat, Neo. Merry Christmas to everyone. Uh, I wanted this to be a Christmas-related stream, but then this idea of what watch have you, have you been wearing the most sort of came to mind and I thought it would be really cool to just get everyone riffing. If anyone's watching after the stream, like I said in the very beginning, get into the comment section below and comment what you've been wearing the most and why. I think the why is also important. Um, so everyone, welcome, welcome to everyone who's just joined. Uh, ben Space Vulture, talk about the amazing Omega Seamaster 2254 with sword hands. Okay, yeah, I dig it. It's a watch that I've actually been looking at quite a lot recently because they're, they're amazing bargains you can find online. So uh, <laughs> there's, there's the image. I, I really enjoy making thumbnails. It's a lot of fun. Like I find, I find a great reference image and then I put a strap on and I change the color to give it that blue tinge to match up with the seal. So this is the video that I did on it, discussing it. After having hands on time with a, a proper MOD Seamaster, this watch just, just appeals to me more and more just because of the fact that you don't see brands going out of their way to pick up and, and sort of pay homage to these pieces in such a good way. And I think most of us can agree that for its time period, it's one of those Seamasters that really has defined itself. And for the, the community who appreciates the aesthetic of the, the Millspec inspired watches, it's, it's a piece that's going to get a lot of attention over time. And people have made amazing modifications to the watch. I always return back to, I mean, just look at that. They did the right thing. They, they got rid of the, the 90s style bracelet. They sort of aged it a little bit more modern in a way. It just gave it the standard Speedmaster bracelet. The only criticism that I have with the watch, and I'm sure everyone knows, uh, it's the bezel insert. And the one adjustment I would change is, uh, let's see if I can find it, Planet Ocean bezel. I tend to always bring this up in a discussion. Uh, here we go, here's an example. I think that looks so nice and clean, modern. It also tones down the size of the bezel, makes it look a little bit more uh, open. I don't know if that's your cup of tea, but I like the modern sort of aesthetic, not the big, bold, brash, uh, standard numerals as much. But that's just me, personal preference. Really dig it. And uh, again, it's a watch that pays tribute 
in a way that a lot of brands haven't done and haven't since, actually. Not even Omega has paid tribute to their MOD pieces as well as they did with this, which is awesome. Um, really enjoy it. If only Amiga would ditch the helium valve, yeah, Ashmore. It is it is a very contentious point, I agree. Um, and Founder Times Capital is wearing the Revolution collaboration with Zinn. That's a great piece. Let's pull that up. I'll just say Revolution Zinn. I've seen them going on eBay for a crazy, crazy amount of money. Uh, you know, when, whenever there's a collaboration watch, the big thing is to buy it and then sell it next day and make a profit. It's, it's sad. Um, but here it is. Really cool. Uh, I like that they've they've really underplayed the Revolution logo, similar to the the Smiths Everest in a way. Actually, being able to make it only refract when certain lights hit when certain light hits it from a, a different angle. You have a, a bezel that you can use for timing, which is practical. You don't have a, a tachymeter or a telemeter or anything else. Really useful. Um, it's cool. And I see lots of guys just chatting. It's awesome. Nice to see that everyone's chatting away. Um, Marathon, that's at MGMAs. Thank you for the suggestion. Marathon, that's the brand that uses tritium on their pieces, if um, if Ron is still watching. Thomas Burnett, thank you so much, brother. I'm going to reply to your email. And uh, yeah, great. I, lo I love our long email collaborations. It's awesome. And Rich Buddy mentions ball watches also with tritium. Yeah, ball watches, Marathon, that's what I meant, not um, glycine. I'm not the best on the, on the cuff talking. Um, let's see what else is going on. I'm trying my best to keep up with the comments that are linked to, that are worded to me directly. So it makes, makes things a little bit easier to, to keep in touch and to keep track of. Uh, there's a mention about a Milgauss white dial. I think the Milgauss is one of those pieces that is, I, I, I loved it. I, it's a video that I did, I don't know, again, a few months ago and highly recommend you watch it. I called it something like, the Einstein Rolex. And I sort of, I looked at the vintage Milgauss and how it evolved through various generations, the original, which was just a complete, no one knew what it was, and how it developed into the 1019, which was a great reference, and how this piece sort of plays off both in different ways. You have the lightning bolt, seconds hand. It's a really good video. I highly recommend you watch it just because I wrote it out, so it was a lot more like concise and structured. And I sort of took the two vintage references, put them side by side next to this. And you can clearly see the inspiration that went into this piece. And uh, for that reason, the Milgauss keeps that quirky nature with its, its lightning bolt seconds hand, but at the same time, looks like a 1019, keeps that aesthetic as well. Uh, there's a question from Founders Times Capital saying, what we wear, what watch do we wear the most, new or vintage? Well, that's the question. Depending on where you're sitting, whether or not you are someone who is big on vintage pieces, I don't know. It's it's a double-edged sword. I mean, geez, if, if I had all the money in the world, I would probably enjoy a good share of both. I think it's great to just enjoy everything that you can get your hands on. Um, it's awesome. Okay. Uh, catching up with everything else. It's great that everyone's chatting. It's nice to like slow down a little bit more. <laughs> I can just catch up with the questions that are directed at me, which is nice. Um, anyway, um, I, I can't, uh, I found it, James, you're asking about, you pay two and a half for the, for the Zin. Thoughts on a strap for the watch? I would love a strap that matches the, the Fotina on the dial, actually. Some kind of tan finish would be nice. If you could find a Bunt strap that has a tan finish, that might be cool. Also look at the bezel, pair off with that matte gray finish. That would also be nice. Um, I don't know how I feel about this watch, actually. Um, just in general, I, I don't know. You see, the thing is, I don't know much about the brand of Zinn and, and what they do. I don't know if this is paying, I'm sure this is paying tribute to a older reference from a long time ago. I don't know if, if Revolution added their own touch with regards to the bezel and, and all of those details, but it is cool. And I see a question from uh, jo Jorgen. Uh, I didn't read your comment. I think you might be linking. I've been using my newly acquired Sotina for the last few days. Sotina DS. Let's have a look. Great suggestion. It's nice to try and slow down. I do realize, and I have this has been called out often, that I tend to um, run all over the show when we talk about watches. Oh, geez. Sotina DS PHS. Uh, PH. Here we go. Oops. Apologies. 
Now, Sutina, if I, again, it's a brand that I haven't covered, but it is a brand that is very old, and they're bringing back their pieces in a new way, a new approach. I think this is the reference you're talking about. You know, I really like it. Hey, we've got a we've got a geophysique sort of uh, center dial. What would we call it again? What's the what's the term? Really nice balance. Sword hands. Hell, this is a cool watch. Jorgen, thank you for the suggestion. It is called the, the Sotina DS PH 200 meters. I really like this piece. It's so seldom that you find watches with sword hands. And uh, these sword hands were done so well. Fully graduated bezel. This is sick. I'm guessing it sits at around 42 mils, roughly. Like the contrast, like the spot color. Kind of reminds me of my Jeannot Ocean Rover. I really like the idea of having a, a spot color on the seconds hand. Brings out the brings out the legibility a bit more. Allows you to separate your eye from the dial and from the hands themselves and to just keep track of the running seconds. It's really cool, you know? Really like that approach. This is a nice, really nice watch. Thank you for the suggestion. And again, uh, this is what we do on this page. It's all about that interaction and getting some ideas across about pieces we like. The aesthetics on this piece are spot on. I think if I had to make one criticism is the just the, the general numeral layout on the dial is a little bit too cluttered when we pair it next to the minute track. The whole idea behind adding all of these graduations to the bezel was to make the watch more legible at a glance for combat swimmers because they couldn't see the minute track. That's the idea. So when you include a very, very brash minute track with a very brash bezel insert, it gets a bit conflicting. And in this example, we see that the, the actual batons are a little bit overcrowded. Color is a very important thing. The, the use of line weight in any product is important. And for this reason, you kind of get lost a little bit when you look at the dial at a glance. Sick though, I still, I, I love the idea of, of sword hands and. Uh, the date is so nicely framed. It's that kind of stuff. I mean, that doesn't put me off. I, I normally hate offset date winners, but this, when it's framed nicely and it's been thought through, makes a difference. Great, great suggestion. Um, there is the name of the watch if anyone's interested in it. Hell, I might even get my hands on one. That is really nice. Um, okay, I'm catching up with a bit more. Mr. Perpetual is mentioning, I've been wearing the Tudor Black Bay Bronze Slate. The reason it doesn't have a date function, but no, oh, sorry. Uh, the reason is it doesn't have a date function, but now we're close to Christmas. I can't, I can remember the date easily. Yeah, true. And that's another thing. As an everyday wearing watch, a watch that we wear the most, I'm sure a lot of people gravitate towards watches with date complications just because it's a bit more practical. I'm a bit neurotic in a way. I'm not such a fan of dates on watches. Um, let's see if I can find another reference quick to pull up for someone. Uh, uh, no, have I lost? Is there anything else? Uh, jeepers, Zin U1. Let's see. I'm just I'm just scrolling through, as per usual. <laughs> we sort of got off topic. We've we've passed the half an hour point. We've now just hit an hour. So now we can kind of get back into the the fray of just talking about watches in general. Uh, but I'd really like to try and keep the theme focused around uh, related pieces related to uh, wearing most often this year. So Zin U1, I've just gotten to, and I'm trying to catch up. I've seen there's a super chat all of a sudden that's popped up. Pam352 has been my most regular. This is from Thomas Burnett. Thomas Burnett deserves a shout out on his pieces. And Thomas, you sent me an email a long time ago with your collection, and I still haven't covered it. I need to do a collection review for Thomas Burnett. I think it would be a nice way to highlight. It's a really sick piece. I think what is nice about Pam or Panerai in general is just the fact that they, they've managed to really stick to their roots with regards to their approach. They're sticking to their guns. Uh, what's, uh, let's find another really good res picture. Sorry about this, everyone. Sometimes internet doesn't cooperate. There's a, there's a thunderstorm going on outside, so that might also affect the, the line speed. No, don't click on it, you moron. Okay, talking about Panerai which we will do for a second, and then I'm going to catch up with everyone else. We're doing quite well, I think. I've only missed about 600 chats. The fact that Panerai is in a situation where they are now. You know, they were really popular in the, in the 90s and 80s, and they, they got huge acclaim, and they've sort of tapered off a little bit. That's not for lack of trying. It's just the trend seems to have faded away, which is quite sad, kind of like the Rolex bubble back craze from years ago. 
But what is admirable is, is the fact that Panerai sticks to their design aesthetic. They have their own clear design aesthetic and they are willing to stick to it. Um, and for that reason, we can give them a lot of props. It's, it's a Marmite watch. It's a watch that not everyone would like to wear. But then again, when we think about how it was designed, the time period when it was designed, um, it's pretty great when you consider just where it was used, by who, the fact that Rolex made movements for them back in the day. Panerai needs to have a long write-up from me, and it will happen in the future. We need to discuss them in more detail. I think as a dive watch, the, the legibility factor is very old school, very deco in the way they've approached the numerals. The sandwich dial, it's just awesome. The balance on this piece, they seem to work very well with the way they balance the, the offset, sub-seconds, and the date complication. I kind of like the way they approach it in that way. What's interesting, if we just sort of squint our eyes and look at the watch, you see this large registered crown guard and how it plays in tandem with the nine and the sub dial on either side. So that weight is kind of countered in a way, visually. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. I've been chatting about this too long, <laughs> but I love sticking on topics. So Ron is asking about the Zin U1. Thank you so much for the super chat again, Ron. And I'd be interested in knowing like, if, if someone could, if Ron could maybe cover what it's like being on call, are you, are you generally on call often? Are you like on call right now and you're just listening to the stream on your phone? <laughs> so the Zin U1, again, it's a watch I haven't looked at. I don't know if this is, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is paying homage to a, a traditional piece in some way. You know, we clearly see that it has these seven, late 60s, early 70s inspired needle hands, which is cool. From a legibility point of view, I can see that it is a thousand meter dive watch, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Does it have a helium release valve? Uh, no, it probably doesn't, which is cool. It's interesting how brands like tend to always try and push the depth rating and then uh, they offer all these features like helium release valves and everything else. But the reality is they aren't exactly necessary. Uh, for most, because we would never go to a depth of a thousand meters under so a kilometer underwater. So immediately off the bat, I think what really speaks about this watch well is the is the highlights, the fact that you see white and red so clearly. Now the question is, does the color sort of correspond to the watch's function? Uh, in that, I mean, we look at the hour and the minute hand and how it corresponds with the dial and the numerals or, or the batons and the plots on the dial. That's very cool. And then we see how the red sort of corresponds with the bezel and how the bezel works. Um, I think that's its biggest strong point. I think color is very important. With regards to its size and proportions, it would be nice to see the numerals just a little bit bigger to fill up that empty space once again. But this is Zinn. And for that reason, it looks as German as German could be. Um, I really dig the way they've addressed color with this watch. I think that's the thing that really pulled me at first. It's nice to see a brand that has a good understanding. Generally, German design tends to always have a very good understanding of, of color theory, of where to pull your attention around. I think if you want a, a watch that really has function in mind, German mil spec inspired, I guess U1 has to do with a certain branch of the military, if I'm not wrong. Um, German watches tend to always have a good focus on those details. And I think Zinn, just in general, Zinn watches, it's another brand I need to discuss in more detail. Time, as always, the only thing that's really holding me back is time. And I think it's such a great irony <laughs> to discuss. Uh, okay, I've missed a lot of others. So we have a super chat from Joe Ross. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it from Texas. That is awesome. It's so nice that I'm reaching different parts of the world and that Americans actually enjoy this uh, uh, South African slash English accent. It's, it's cool. It must sound very weird. Um, I can't wait to spend some time in America. It's going to be awesome. Um, okay. I'm going to just scroll down and catch up because I see lots of long, long questions. Um, I have a question from Vuong Chao. Or Kao. I can't get your so apologies. If I got your name wrong. We're talking about Vostok Classica. Now Vostok, another brand that I've, never paid attention to <laughs> and that's my wrongdoing uh this looks this looks almost bang on like a glasuta right or i can never get the name right glasuta is the, is the name is the way you pronounce it this looks just like a glasuta original um classic what do they call it 
There's a certain dial variant that has this, this layout. And I think when we talk about any reference that has this kind of format, a, let's get another example up that's clearer. I think this is from Random Rob. He makes some good stuff. Um, this, this dial layout is very hit and miss. I think this was kind of inspired around the 60s. So uh, it sort of speaks to certain people. What, what I do like about it, when we, again, squint your eyes and look at the dial, you can see that the numerals all seem to be in relation to each other, kind of like uh, Arabic numerals in a way. They've been, they've been really tightened up to a, to a point where you look at the three, you look at the 12, the six, the nine, they all seem to be in the same kind of realm with regards to their proportions. And that's quite interesting. It's a, it's a fascinating way of approaching it. And I think that's what they kind of had in mind when they thought about this font or this, this typeface usage making it in such a way that it's easy to read and that every numeral sort of corresponds. I mean, you can't ever go wrong with a simple 12, 3, 6, 9. It's nice and balanced. It's cool. Nice to chat about Vox Doc for a change. Um, very cool. And uh, I'm going to see. <laughs> There's so many comments. Uh, I don't know where to start. Ron is talking about psychiatry. Psychiatry call isn't as bad as internal medicine or surgery, but you're basically in the hospital for 24 hours straight. I don't know how you do it, huh? And I, I, I forgot that you were a psychiatrist. Um, yeah, I, I've, I'm from a quite a strong medical family background and uh, always loved it. I've worked under cardiothoracic surgeons. I've worked under plastic surgeons, cardiac ab abrasions. I've always loved cardiothoracic. I think the heart would be the area that I would be most drawn to if I got into the field. I think it'd be great. Um, as a designer, I would love to design for the medical industry. Um, designing the tools in the theaters, being able to see just how they're used and the processes and just how, it's amazing. I've seen open heart surgery on a six month old child, not even six months, I don't think. And it was freaking godsend, the most incredible thing you've ever seen. As a retired track uh, chap, I lose track of the day of the week from, from Selton, thank you. Um, the Oris Artelia pointer day date, <laughs> the daily wearer. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I've never heard of that piece before. I can honestly say. Um, and again, again, guys, I apologize if I'm missing some of your chats. I am only one person here, and I'm trying to keep the discussions as rounded as possible. I like to focus on as broad a subject range as possible while still trying to keep everything grounded. Hell, this would make an awesome daily wearer. So it's, I mean, I've never seen this piece before. It's a great, great suggestion. Thank you so much for this, Selton. Uh, where is a good example of the dial? I think black sort of speaks to me a little bit more on first impressions. I mean, this is almost like a gray slate sort of finish. Really neat and tidy. You know, again, once again, it's, it's down to whether you are a dress watch person, whether you are a sports watch person. <laughs> I really can't speak tonight. I don't know. I've mixed wine and whiskey tonight, so I think that's sort of <laughs> affecting me in a way. Um, it's all down to whether you're a dress watch or a sports watch guy. It's impressive to see that they've executed a day date in such a simple way. I like the idea of a day date complication being out there and external on the dial instead of just a, a rotating sub dial somewhere hidden. It's nice to see it on display. And I think the best example, so as a watch, I think as an, as an everyday wearing dress watch, it looks sweet. And there's other references in between. This looks even better. And this, is, this reminds me of that Patek 5212 that we talk about all the time. This little, this little hand, oh, it's so sick. I really like it. I really, really like it. I don't know about the proportions. Is it like 40 mils or something? So again, Oris makes some amazing things. And I, I tend to bring up this piece a lot. I made a video about the 5212 a while back. And just the thought that it's a Patek Philippe, A, the fact that it's steel, the most important thing is that it looks so understated. As an everyday wearing piece, it doesn't look like a Patek Philippe. And I think that's what really hits it on the head. Uh, you, can you can wear this every day. No one will be the wiser. Someone would probably just say, hey, nice Seiko. And you can say, thanks, man. <laughs> you know, it's a really cool thing. Um, I think I've actually managed to catch up. I'm sure I've missed a lot of your, your chats, everyone. But I'm going to try and keep up with what's going on at the base of us. Um, Madman is saying that the Tudor North flag and Pelagos, G-Shock, awesome. 
really nice. Let's pull up a let's pull up a North Flag as an example. Tudor North Flag has a really cool history behind it. And what what's actually pitiful is that Tudor doesn't emphasize this enough on their promotional material. Uh, the North Greenland expedition. I mean, I, th I think the way I wrote up about this watch, I did a video about it a couple of months ago, as per usual. It's always a couple of months ago. Uh, time, Tempus Fugit, right? Um, the fact that Tudor sort of like in a one-liner describes this watch saying, yeah, yeah, pays tribute to the, the North Greenland expedition, whatever. They don't specify just how like important the, the, the expedition was and the background and the archive. And the, if you own the book, a man and his watch. There is the North Greenland expedition piece that was used, and it has all of these amazing records to it. So it's a really nice piece. So for that reason, paying tribute to it, and then sort of attacking it from a, a more retro '70s Tesla Cybertruck sort of way, I think it's really sick. Uh, the power reserve is cool for an everyday wearer. It doesn't really make much sense, but I kind of like the the off balance between the the power reserve, the date. I had a long discussion about it. The highlight is nice, sort of brings back that kind of 90s feel with the way they approached watches and just designs in general. Dig it. Thank you for the suggestion, Madman. I didn't um, I didn't get your question entirely. I just sort of cherry picked what I like to see. <laughs> uh, he's asking about if a Pam would suit him. Great suggestion. Anyway, um, sorry, James, I missed your, your initial thing. Talking about the Edox Hydro Sub, 50th anniversary. Let's pull it up and have a look. Edox is another brand I haven't discussed, but it's an oldie. And uh, oh, there's so many pieces to discuss as time goes by. I, you know, I'm, uh, I kind of wish I had a whole team of people that we could just get these write-ups out quicker. Anniversary, come on. I'm really losing my, uh, my typing speed tonight. I mean, that is a master lock. Is that for the bezel? This is awesome. Look at those highlights. Thank you, James, founder Timeless Capital, for the suggestion. I saw your, your question or your mention of it earlier. This looks freaking awesome. So you've got 70s inspired motifs. Let me try and find better. Can't you give me like a nice frontal face of the piece? I, th I think the, the blue and green really does sing. Uh, this is a 1965 to 2015. I guess this is the, the heritage. And of course, they, they give us low res images. Here we go. Here's a goodie. So Edox, as we know, it's a really old brand, but the fact that they are still pulling the punches, I think this is awesome. I'm sure I've, there's also there's comments about the Patek that we chatted about like 10 minutes ago. Um, love the highlights. Love the blue and the green. The master lock, I'm guessing it's there to lock the bezel. <laughs> it's just my, uh, my initial thoughts. But just the packaging design. All of these little things play play a part in the process. I really like the highlight. Nice bright green, uh, easy to read. This is a much better example. When we when we looked at that Sotina, Sotina a second ago, um, notice how the minute track and the bezel doesn't seem to clash as much. There is, there is an easy enough reading space that you can see what's going on on the dial as well as the plots around the bezel. Very important, really nice idea. Thank you for the suggestion, James, of Founder Timeless Capital. Um, okay, there's <laughs> all sorts of other suggestions. Again, if you'd like to get me to mention a watch, I think it'd be more efficient if I uh, uh, to if you tag me in the chat uh, at ID Guy and you give me a suggestion of the watch that you have or whatever else. This is an awesome everyday piece. Credor, another brand. It's kind of like the how would we say it? The the Lexus of Seiko, right? Um, is that fair, or would it be a better? Would there be a better comparison? So th this is from Leia saying, "Got my Credor two H E T two two months ago, then wore it daily." Great suggestion. I love the fact that we're still keeping to this this discussion of what watch have we been wearing the most. And I mean, again, if you're a dress watch person, sports watch, these Credor watches are insane. They get a lot of praise. And I mean, here is a Mark One against a Mark Two. I can't tell the difference between the two, really. I think this is the second gen, and this is the first gen. Credo is known for just their insane attention to detail. I mean, 44 jewels for a simple 
basically time only with a power reserve. There's there's debates on whether or not more joules means a better movement with regards to accuracy and everything. I always assumed that the more joules a watch had, the uh, the more accurate it would be, the less servicing needed because there's less friction. Um, but I just think it's great. It's it's a sick looking dress watch, very vintage inspired. Um, I don't know how you would improve this, really. I don't. I see again. I don't know the brand very well. I don't know the history. But uh, this crescent moon. I don't know if that has any kind of semblance to the family and the name. Um, again, it's very nice and basic, down to the basics. It looks like a piece from from the '60s, from the '30s. You know, timeless, timeless simplicity. Uh, great suggestion. Thank you, Leia, for that. And Ashmore is saying wine and whiskey in the same glass. Yeah, I wish. No, uh, I started with whiskey about two hours ago and just thought it's been a busy day. I've been, uh, <laughs> I've been away. I've been out of the house all day and coming back, I just thought, hey, let's just jump on and uh, have a chat. Mr. Perpetual says something. We got clam. Jeez, there's so many suggestions. Okay, I'm going to try and focus as much as I can on the, the questions coming from everyone directly to me. Uh, Jorgen saying that the Nomos Club the Nomos Club is one of those watches that doesn't, I don't know. Again, it's, I've chatted about Nomos at length. Nomos establishes their design language around Bauhaus inspired motifs, right? They're all about simplicity. They're all about uh, the basic nature of, of design in general. And the club to me kind of feels like a cop out in a way because it just doesn't speak to what Nomos is about, which is Bauhaus, you know, basic baton, simplicity. You want to be fun and exciting, but I don't know if this is the, the direction. It's good to see that they can go this way. And I think the best, I think Teddy Bolasar actually kind of highlighted this well, saying that it's perfect for the, the new university student, you know, or you've just graduated from university. Is that kind of gift that you would give someone? It's a really, it's a good, I don't know who, who mentioned it, but it's a really good, kind of like aesthetic that goes with the piece. Um, okay, I've missed a lot of these, so I'm gonna try and catch up with everyone else. The Watch Lounge, thank you so much for joining Watch Lounge. Um, okay, okay, okay. Uh, let's see, Ron the Shrink, another super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, what watch do you have an irrational hatred towards? You know, I was thinking about this today, actually. I did a lot of driving today, lots of cross country and you know, I was kind of balancing out my thoughts about just looking at the cars in general. Uh, what's another piece I can just pull up while I chat about this? Um, Chopard. <laughs> the Chopard LUC. I'm sure I've looked at this piece before. LUC XP Navy Blue. Nice. Nice. Okay. I'll pull this up and kind of just word my, oh, this is gorgeous. Gorgeous. Very cool. I don't know about the hands. They kind of remind me of uh, of oars. You know, if anyone's an avid rower from the past, if anyone's done rowing before, kind of get that idea. Nice aesthetic. Love the finish on the dial. So answering Ron's question, very you got some very insightful question, insightful questions, Ron. Um, is there a watch that I have an irrational hatred towards? No, not really. What watch do I have? An, it's it, and referring that back to cars, driving on the roads. You can't say that you love every car that you see. There are some hideous, horrendous cars. And for some reason, that person decided to buy it and thought, hey, this is the one for me, you know? Uh, and in that way, it's very difficult to like, to, to clarify what is good, what is bad. I don't know. I, when I look at a watch brand, it's nice to, to think about what defines them as a name. Now, of course, I'm not, I'm, I'm new to this hobby. I haven't started it. You know, I've only been doing this for, well, learning about watches for, oh, I don't know, five years or so. Um, but it's good to to look at a brand and understand what they're trying to approach. I mean, okay, Chopard, great watches. They've, they've done some amazing dress watches. You go for Chopard because they've, I mean, they've got amazing movements, great in-house stuff. But then they dropped the, uh, what was that? going to say Genta, and I'm sure I'll get that answer. That's that eagle, the Alpine Eagle. Now, of course, it's paying tribute to a watch they brought out many years ago. But you kind of have to ask yourself in the back of your mind, is this what Chopard is about? Were they doing this just to jump on 
the bandwagon? And the answer is obviously yes. And then we can pull up the Lunga Odysseus, another watch that seems hell-bent on playing with all the big boys in the steel category. Of course, Lunga has a different approach and actually kind of be respected in the way that they've brought out a new movement with the piece and everything. So in that sense, I don't have a, I wouldn't say I have an irrational hatred towards a watch uh, or a brand, but when a brand doesn't fulfill their criteria with regards to their, their motifs, their expression, their thoughts that have gone into their pieces, this isn't Lunga. Lunga is about classics. You know, they're about classical design aesthetics. There are little bits and pieces in this watch, sure. So in a sense, this sits a lot higher in the, in the charts compared to that, which is just taking all the little elements that we have come to know from all the other steel brands. So I guess that's the best way I could describe it <laughs> briefly. <laughs> uh, Atticus is asking, thoughts on the Zodiac Grand Rally? Zodiac has some sick watches, really cool pieces. And I think I am probably missing so many chats that I'm going to pull this up and just catch up with everyone else as we go. Really dig it. Um, I don't know the if this is paying homage to a vintage piece. Once again, if this is a, uh, a recreation of an older piece. When I think Zodiac, I think Seawolf. I think they're GMTs. I got some hands on with a, with a 50s GMT with a Bakelite bezel and everything. And it is so, so stellar. This is cool. I like the orange. This kind of reminds me of that micro brand that produces a very similar, very similar piece. I can't for the life of me, remember the name, but they make some awesome chronographs. Um, I'm going to catch up with everything else. Okay, let's see what else there is. From James, found the timeless capital. The new show pod, every, that every bag on YouTube revolution, just name a watch of the year. My friend of mine, Paris, bought one. Yeah, that, and that's, I guess that's another thing, James. It's, it's talking about the watch without seeing it. I don't know if, if this is a recent comment or if I've kind of missed it. It's kind of nice. What I dig is when I talk and there's like no comments because you're listening to me, but then it's like <laughs> I lose out on so much stuff. Um, I need to see the movement on that show pod. I do. Uh, the, uh, so I, I guess that's, I mean, that's the thing. That's uh, just underlying detail. Um, when a brand stays true to what they're about, their approach, um, that's when I can really appreciate what they're doing. Not so much when they're trying to go out of their way. But again, with the show pod, they are paying homage to their original piece. So that's something. Um, Crappy Luxury is talking about all the different tranquilizers available. That's cool to know. <laughs> Interesting to hear his thoughts on that. Um, okay. It's nice. Uh, let's see if I can catch up with everything else. I think I'm doing quite well. Surprising, I've actually managed to catch up with everyone. That's good. Okay, so let's chat more about the show pod because it is, it's, I don't, I really don't know what to think about it at all. It's, it, I find it so jarring. I see the bracelet. The first thing I think when I see the bracelet is Vacheron Overseas Gen 1. Okay, but I mean, you know, to each their own, to each their own taste, as always. It's, it just doesn't speak. Clearly to me, I don't know. How could they have improved it? That could be a whole video in itself. Um, yeah, there's so much. Um, but, it, but I haven't mentioned the movement and I don't even think that's another thing. When, when a company, or when I say when the media doesn't seem to cover the movement as well, I think I've been caught up with the design aesthetics and haven't looked at the movements. I'm sure this piece has, I, I, don't even, I haven't focused on the calibers at all. So I will do that. I think I should look at do a bit more research into the watch before I really speak my mind. Um, I don't know. When I saw the watch, I think this watch released almost in tandem with the Lunga Odysseus, right? Roughly. And something about the Lunga just sort of grabbed me a bit more. I don't know what it is. And this was before I had seen a Lunga in the flesh and everything else. So, yeah, it's all, once again, up to personal preference and tastes and everything else. Um, but But the watch, to me, I think they've, just on the outset, just looking at the show pod and what they've done, it's kind of like they're trying a little bit too hard. <laughs> I think that's the, the simplest way I could say it. They're, they're attacking it a little bit too hard um, with regards to the, the screws and the bezel and everything else. I don't know. And I think we could kind of look at the Piaget Polo in a way and sort of discuss that as well. But anyway, 
This is pretty cool. I'm glad that I've actually been able to keep up with this. So again, anyone new who's joining the stream tonight, uh, we were talking about what watches have you been wearing the most this year. And I th it's, it's an interesting thing because it's all dependent on the seasons, how the seasons have changed and whether or not straps appeal to you more, whether or not bracelets do. Do you want a more casual wearing watch? Do you want something that makes a statement? Um, oh, Dear Artifact asking. Dear Artifact asks some of the coolest uh, questions. We had a good chat the last stream, I think. And again, I've linked Dear Artifact's uh, post. I'll actually link it again. Let's do it right now. Uh, have a look at this. If anyone has not seen this, have a read of this article. Talks about his Grail watch, really goes in depth, has a good, like, debate against himself with regards to different brands and everything. I still haven't read it fully. I haven't been at home today, so I haven't been able to really sit down and have a look, but uh, it's cool. So with regards to the Cartier tank, very, very good question. Um, and I see Derek saying female timepiece. <laughs> it's very, it's, it's debatable, I think. Uh, this watch deserves a lot more attention. Uh, just because the it, what's interesting i was actually chatting i met up with cam of craft and tailored we had a good chat about cartier we tried on some amazing watches and um, it seems like there is a trend of cartier returning for a lot of people there is a uh, this this draw i think channels like theo and harris have really perpetuated the the attention to these watches um and then you see these stories about you know jackie kennedy's and uh Andy Warhol, the, the story is that Andy Warhol, he never set the time on his watches. He's such a badass. He would just buy a watch and throw it into a loft above his bed every night. And when they were checking out his house, they found hundreds and hundreds of watches that just fell through and all of his pieces. He never set the time on them. He just wore them because they were cool. And I think when you look at the, the, the language of the tank, it's one of those watches that goes down like the 1016 Explorer uh, and a whole myriad of other pieces. It's, it's got an amazing design aesthetic. The dial is so characteristic of Cartier, and I think that's one thing that really pulls. Um, proportions and sizes have changed. There's all sorts of other references. You know, you've got the Noctambul, you've got the Santos. I made a big video about the Santos a while ago. I uh, it should be on the channel if you just uh, search ID Guy. Cartier Santos. And I run through a bit of the history and just how these watches developed. I think the aesthetic is something that is timeless. Uh, I don't know if the tank is the watch that would appeal to me the most in the family, but it is undoubtedly one of the big icons of the name. And I think what's, what's so nice about it is you can put it on and just not think about it. You know, it has that kind of profile where, where's a good, come on, give me a good wrist shot. Uh, just a scale down piece. I don't know. Because it's so micro thin and small and easy to wear and use, it's the kind of watch that you would expect to wear, you know, on an evening when you're sitting back, throwing down whiskeys, cocktails, just enjoying the low light, you know, just enjoying yourself in a situation. It's one of those watches that you just can put on, not even feel. And uh, there's, it says something when a man wears a Cartier tank, I think. Um, there's this talk about women loving it a lot. Of course, I mean, it, it really is. Every woman seems to know exactly what a Cartier tank is, and that's amazing when you think about it. You can show a Cartier tank to virtually anyone in the world, preferably females, and they will be like, whoa, this, we know what this is. We, we love it, and uh, it's amazing. And I think that has to do with just recognition with regards to the people that have worn them in the past, the, the famous women that have worn them. But for a male to wear a Cartier tank, it makes one hell of a statement. And it's, I think it's really cool for that reason. Uh, and exactly, we're talking about people who have worn the tank. Who hasn't worn the tank in history? JFK, uh, Muhammad Ali, Andy Warhol, the Beatles, uh, geez, Rolling Stones, uh, Mick Jagger, not Mick Jagger, uh, Keith Richards, all of these guys, all the big names. Practically, practically anyone through the 60s and 70s wore it because it was just cool. And um, the sizes changed, I mean, of course. But, uh, but then we, we transitioned to other pieces. Uh, I think the tank Cintre is an example of a watch that really, really is slick and fascinating. Here's a collaboration that Revolution did. 
Uh, it's nice to be talking about these because this is another one of these watches that could make a perfect everyday, easy wearing watch. Um, we have the Centre, we have the American, which was the watch that McQueen made famous, if I remember right, that he wore in the Thomas Crown Affair, I think, I hope. I hope I'm right, <laughs> sort of guessing on the fly. I think the American has quite an appeal. Uh, I like the elongated stretch nature to it. It's nice. But again, what, what Cartier has managed to do so well with these tank pieces is that aesthetic. It just remains, no matter if you've elongated it, no matter if you've squatted it, no matter if you uh, turn it into a crash, for example. I mean, the crash is a little bit strange for a Cartier-related piece, but again, it's that dial that seems just timeless. Awesome story behind this watch. I think it's very cool. So with regards to the, uh, the trend and the appeal for these pieces, uh, I am of the belief, I think the tank is a watch that's going to make a return in years to come. Another thing is that you can wear it now and it still looks as good as it did all those years ago. Um, but yeah, we've been on the tank for a while. I don't know why the mouse likes to mess me around. Here we go, isn't a good example. Um, just simple, elegant, easy, and design aesthetics. We can talk about the JLC Reverso as another awesome piece for an everyday wearer. Uh, the rectangular shape, in relation to the strap, I think is brilliant. The idea that the strap almost dictates the, the watch's head size and everything else. You know, sometimes it's great to have a watch that isn't in your face and it isn't round. Who says that a watch needs to be round, you know? And for that reason, they've just really been able to capitalize on that idea. And the, the story goes that it was inspired by a, a, a Renault tank used in the First World War. Um, I've looked at the schematics, the top-down views and everything. It's kind of strange. It doesn't exactly line up, but it is pretty cool. Okay, I've missed a lot of these chats. Kim Kardashian. Um, yeah, Octo Finissimo, Peter Wong. I think I'm asked about this all the time. Uh, yeah, I always I have this, this uh, strange thought about it. What I've always said is that you can't deny the watch's movements are incredible. I, I love the finishing on these pieces. Having a gunmetal finish really gives it this anti-reflective quality and it just looks so neat and tidy. Uh, but it, it's the size, it's the size and the braces integration that doesn't really hook me. Um, but then again, has that Italian-esque inspired motif around it. Um, and in a way, we look at just how the uh, the Tesla Cybertruck has become this new motif that everyone's being inspired by. These 80s inspired designs are starting to make a resurgence. And in that way, this watch is probably going to get a lot more attention for that reason. I notice Watchbox likes to feature this piece a lot on their page. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's a lot of interest in them. I don't know if they appeal to a lot of people. For me, it's, once again, it's the size. It's the bracelet size, the width. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in concise designs, ones that are very communicative and easy to understand at a glance. They call this the Octo Finissimo because when we zoom into the bezel, we see that there are, in fact, eight sides on the inside of the bezel and on the outside. And then you have all of these facets and hard edges. I think I chatted about this on the last stream. And this is where the watch kind of loses me. Um, I'm very on the fence. I did a write-up about it, uh, Peter. Um, I think I called it the design problems of the Octo Finissimo. And I looked at Art Deco and just how it doesn't really communicate Art Deco and sort of compare it against the Chrysler building and all sorts of ridiculous stuff. Um, it's a watch that's kind of, it's very conflicting to me, but you can't deny the movement, the, the quality of the build, the finish. I love the finish. I think that's one thing that really, really dig. Um, Everyone's chatting about the tank. That's cool. Goldberger not saying that it's feminine. Yeah, I mean, Gold, if you know Goldberger is going to wear it, then it's pretty sick. And I think smaller watches really have that appeal. I, I really enjoy it. If you don't follow him on Instagram, follow John Gold, Goldberger on Instagram. He's got some amazing watches. Um, okay. Um, uh, James says he doesn't think he would see a tank on his wrist. His wife likes it. Yeah, and I think it, it does have a feminine appeal. Um, all, all metal G-Shock from DB. You mentioned that in the very beginning. I think DB was one of the first guys on the channel tonight. 
I'm so glad that we were able to do this. I can't, I had this thought in the back of my mind that it would be quite a flat evening because, you know, we've just hit the holidays and uh, everyone's doing their own thing. I was very reserved about starting a show and thinking, hey, there won't be many people on and chatting. But it's nice, nice to be able to do this. And next week, I've got a really cool topic idea that I think we all enjoy. Um, where's a nice high res image? That's another thing about G Shock I've noticed, and just Casio watches in general, is that they don't tend to like hone in on the high res images. So the G Shock is another one of those watches. I think when we talk about industrial design, let's try and get a nice high res. Come on, work with me here. We talk about industrial design. I think the G Shock is one of those pieces that hit hit the ball out of the park with regards to the approach, the uh, the thought for use, the build for purpose, the idea that these are pretty much watches that are used by military forces now. It's it's like the accepted watch for anyone to use in any situation. And for that reason, it's superb. I think that the motive behind creating this watch is something quite special. But with regards to being all metal, I don't know. I think the rubber has a bit more of a, a, a better approach just simply because rubber is a more elastic substance. So you can throw it against the wall and you can smash it around and it, you know, it doesn't take damage as opposed to a full metal. I don't understand why they polished the watch so much. I mean, are they expecting the watch to get scratched to pieces like, like it's going to happen? But I think the G-Shock just from an industrial design point of view is great. The, um, and just the, the sheer amount of watches that they've been able to produce over the years if uh, I wanted to do a challenge, actually, and design my own G-Shock, that'd be really nice. Get my penmanship skills to the test. <laughs> um, yeah, really cool. Nice suggestion. Thank you, DB. It's cool that we can pull up these pieces, chat about Cartier tanks. Well, um, you know, everything else. It's cool. Cartier Roadster. Yeah, it's an awesome watch, James. really is cool. Um, and I see Ashmore saying, couldn't agree, the Cartier crash is a single coolest thing. <laughs> it is sick. And the story is awesome. Really dig it. Um, and everyone's still talking about Cartier. That's awesome. And oh, now we're jumping to Casio's. <laughs> Casio's hipster. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not a watch that's ever really appealed. Digital watches in general don't appeal to me. I remember I, I've had digital watches when I was a youngster. But um, the, the, the G-Shock Titanium, let's have a look at that. Thank you for that. James, titanium. Now that is a better metal. Oh, wow, nice finish. First time I've seen this piece. Whoa, this is cool. Check it out. We've got some camo patterns on it. This is a, this, and again, this is a better approach. Uh, we don't, why would you want a polished finish on a watch like this? When we think about G-Shocks, we think rubberized. We think elastic. We think bounce. We think... Uh, versatile, usable, can take an explosion and still work, you know? Yeah, again, I'll emphasize the developmental storyline behind this watch is superb. Uh, there aren't many pictures of this titanium piece. It looks like it's just been released with Bluetooth. <laughs> Full titanium with Bluetooth. I guess it helps syncing with the atomic clock. That's just my wild guess. I like the finish. It's quite interesting. Kind of reminds me of the uh, the Royal Oak with the way they've done the, the stippling on the on the case and everything to get that polished effect. It's really cool. So what I plan on doing, I think, oh, geez, we've almost hit two hours at this point. That is insane. Why does the time go so fast? Uh, Casio Oak. I love that. I love that. That was a, a quote. I remember seeing it on Instagram. Awesome. Um, oh, it's so cool to... Uh, to be able to catch up with the chat and, and stick to it. I think I'll, from now on, I'll stick to reading out comments that have my, my name. Awesome. Ron the Shrink. And anyone who is commenting, ID guy as one word. No space between the ID and guy because then it doesn't come up as an orange highlight on my screen and I can't see it. Just uh, as, a, as a pointer to anyone who might, I might have missed. Uh, Ron the Shrink has an irrational hatred towards Namas because I associated with beta males. <laughs> uh, uh, that's quite a low jab <laughs> below the belt. Um, no, but I mean, I don't know how best to describe it. I've I've tried my my best to hone in. Maybe I'll make another video in the future. The 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 standard the Orion is the model that I really like. Um, the movements are great. They're affordable, which is cool. But the argument I always have, I think, let's just hit this one more time because it's 
it's a nice point to sort of discuss. Here's a good example. I mean, that's really sick. I love it. For a brand to say that they're inspired behind uh, about Bauhaus motifs. Bauhaus was about simplicity and everything else, but at the same time, uh, Bauhaus was also adventurous with regards to the way they approach design. So for that reason, I'm just going to pull up a 14060. The Submariner is a clear Bauhaus-inspired watch through and through because we have triangles, we have circles, we have batons. That approach was very much a part of the aesthetic. They wanted to eliminate the old school time only kind of idea with numerals and replace it with, with that kind of format. So technically then, every brand, Lunga, the Lunga Odysseus, based on Bauhaus motifs, you know, uh, where does it end? And that's the real thing that kind of grabs me or doesn't really appeal to me about Nomos in general. You say you're sticking to Bauhaus, then you can be adventurous. Um, you don't need to be so stern and restrained. But I mean, geez, they make some good stuff. I dig this olive green dial. I always, olive always wins me over at the end of the day. Um, okay. Tennessee Mike Cassio Oak. Yeah, I love it. It's such, such a cool quote. Um, take a look at citizen stuff. Give me some suggestions on citizen pieces. Um, Atticus, thoughts on the Captain Cook? That's the Rado. Is it, is it Rado or was it Rado? Never, never known. 37 millimeter Captain Cook. And since we're on the discussion, okay, this looks like a very specific Captain Cook. I'm not, uh, I don't know this dial layout on this piece. Well, geez, the first thing I, I, I notice, I mean, it's, it's great that they have this sort of pull to the heritage, but I think the dial is quite, in certain lights, you wouldn't even be able to read the dial. Am I right? Um, just on this point, there is a brand that I've really tried to get involved with, and I hope to get a piece to review very soon. And the name is Serica Watches. French company, uh, sponsored and hosted by Matt Hranik, who wrote A Man and His Watch. And when you said Captain Cook, I immediately thought about the handset. These watches are superb. I'm actually sitting right on the fence and saying that I want to get myself one of these because it has all these little elements of field watch, of simple approaches using the right materials. So this watch looks, it's very seldom that I say a micro brand watch looks designed, but this watch really hits it well. It's got a manual wind movement, 38 mils inside, 37 mils in size. Oh, it looks so cool. And they've got alpha hands. I really suggest you follow their page. I will type in the name of the family and check them out on Google. They look, they really look sick, Thomas. I really, really dig them. I really hope to get some in my hand to review. Uh, of, the, of the watches, the ones that appeal to me the most, black dial, Captain Cook hand, looks awesome. And the white dial, I think the, the more alpha style hand, I mean, look at that. How sweet is that? And they have custom straps. They have Halloween straps and everything you can get off their page. Um, really cool. So, yeah. If anyone's watching from any micro brand or whatever else, send me an email. It's in my About section on my channel. I'd love to do some collaborations. I, I'm quite particular with the watches that I want to talk about because I like to focus on design. I like seeing when a brand is able to focus on design a bit more. And uh, as far as field watches go and, and just thought has gone into the piece. Once again, referring back to what watch you could wear most on an everyday basis. How useful is this for an everyday wearing watch? It's toned down, simple enough to be worn as an everyday piece, but complicated enough that you're not going to get bored looking at it. Nice distortion. I think it's got a, a plexi crystal. Uh, the bezel has got, oh, there's so much to discuss. I'd love to get one and, and write a review on it. Um, okay. Catching up with everyone else. I've missed a few chats earlier. Victorinox. Okay, so jumping back to Captain Cook. Not so much of a fan of the brown dial. I understand that it's there to pay tribute to uh, watches of the 60s and 70s. I don't know if this is a true rendition of the piece from the time. Um, I much prefer the, the standard, just the simple, simple layout, the basic flat color contrast. For a diver, I think it's very important because just, just how sunlight ref refracts and, and issues the watch. Really like the idea that the logo spins in the dial. I think it's very interesting. Nice feature to the watch. Um, okay. This is cool. Talking about brands in general. Nice to be able to like slow down. I'm sure I've missed a few chats. So if, if I have, please repeat them again. Um, 
So let's see. And again, if you want to get a hold of me, tag me at ID Guy, and it'll be easier for me to read everything. So that'll be cool. Seiko Jade Monster. I made a video on the monster a while ago. I think I said, is it loved? Is it feared? Sh should it be loved? I think this is the watch I used in the thumbnail as well. And I can't even, it was again, another video I did a long time ago. Um, I really like what they did with the monster just because it's fun, it's quirky, it's exciting. And uh, just the color options. The dial is also, it's so, so cool. Um, I really like it. Of course, the, the thing is, it's a very aggressive design. I mean, it really is masculine. And that's, <laughs> excuse me, that's what they're going for, you know? For that reason, I think they hit it out the park. The one that really, that still grabs me is the, the orange dial. Just because when I look at it immediately, I see a mouth. I see a mouth with teeth. And I think that's really what they wanted to try and approach. Wanted to make it look as aggressive as possible. And I think this looks like a mouth that's open and it's about to swallow you for that reason. I think that aggression is really sick, um, works well. Okay, RGM William Penn Limited <clears throat> brand I haven't followed. Let's see, I don't even know what RGM stands for, apologies. And since we are approaching the two hour mark, I'm getting slow. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to call it an evening in the next 10 minutes. So. Uh, I'm going to try and keep track with everything else, everyone else's chat. Is this the reference that you're talking about here? Uh, I can't, I've just lost the, I've just lost the reference. I think this is it. US-based watchmaker. I think this might be it. So this is more of a squared off case. Reminds me of the um, the JLC, oh, what's the reference, that, that date reference with the eight-day power reserve, I think it is. Um, I, I must say, I like the ideas when brands are able to offset power reserves like this. And speaking of which, I made a video of FP Jean earlier this week. It was quite, it was just me sitting down chatting about it. And everyone, there was this huge, huge uh, appreciation for the Souverain. I don't even know how to, how to pronounce it. The Souverain, Souverain, Sovereign. And uh, I, I completely agree. I focus on the, the chronometer blue because it's simple in the way it's been approached. I wanted to try and look at it in a way to understand the design language a bit more before going into the, the, the family. Now that I have, I want to do more, I want to do a write up on the Sovereign, uh, Sovereign, whatever it's called, because I think this offset really does, it, it speaks so well with the subdial. This to me is a much more appealing watch because I mean, you've got a, a manual wind movement, you want to know the power reserve, and just that balance, the offset between the numerals and everything, it's so clean and beautiful. Jean does some amazing stuff, and his references are absolutely out of this world. And there's some amazing photographs of them. I think a, collect, a collected man takes such, such amazing photographs of their watches for sale. Okay, I'm going to jump back. Love this. I mean, talk about everyday wearing watch. How's that? How cool is that? Okay. Um, AP Offshore is a daily, and I see uh, the NY0004, whoa, going to get back to that, let's see, going to focus on a citizen, I like to try and give some fair, fair readings between pieces, citizen NY004, so again, citizen's a brand that I haven't focused on entirely, I mean, immediately when I see it, I think Seiko, but they are of a similar sort of family, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Citizen and Orient are related, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong. Um, it's a watch that, that I think, again, this has a similar kind of monster appeal with the way the bezel has been done, the way the dial has been arranged. Nice to see the crown in a left-hand drive position, which is quite cool. I think that's quite unique to the name. And uh, colors and subdials. I mean, I, I don't know. The, the SKX is a watch that's never really appealed to me. So I, I don't know. I'll have to collect some thoughts about it. Since we're kind of closing up shop in the next five minutes, I thought, hey, let's let's uh, you know, try and keep up with everyone else's chats before the night goes, since it is midnight on the side of the world. Uh, AP Offshore, we can pull up quickly. I'm just, okay, what I'm going to do is do a final run through of watches as references. And then I will... Um, come to a close, I think. Oh, geez. Okay. 
Okay, let's have a look. So anyone who's tagged me at ID guy, um, I will be able to see it a bit easier. I'm getting a longer zone, it's like Sonia Thin. So for a daily white, double T. Let's pull up a reference of that. Oh dear, what have I done? Oh dear, mice. Okay, I'm gonna try and be as concise as possible. Longer Saxonia thin with a, I can't see the reference, 205, uh, 086. Okay, oh, this is the style, oh geez, you lucky. SOB, that's all I'm saying. Beautiful, beautiful watch. Okay, next up on the list, 39 millimeter OP, perfect. White dial, mm, can't go wrong with it. 39 millimeter OP. It's nice that we haven't discussed um, Rolex too heavily tonight. How cool is that for a change? I'm chuffed. Um, notice watches, MGMAs. Okay, I'm gonna try and stick to just a few more suggestions from everyone else. Uh, FP Jorn, Holland and Holland. I'm sure that'll look amazing that up as well just as we're closing up for the evening i can just sort of run through a few more pieces because i'm going to sleep like a dead person tonight <laughs> it's been hours and hours of late nights for the last uh the last week oh this is just stunning and this is where they, they did the wood finish on the dial oh it's gorgeous so this is an actual like teak finish they did to it jean 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 cool dude okay Going to just run through everything else. Lunga outside. Okay, okay. I'm missing a few here. I'm going to get back to everyone. Lunga outside date black. Let's pull that up as well. It's quite nice. Closing up shop. Outside date. <laughs> Never heard of this before either. Okay, Saxonia. Okay. Oh, it's just beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, and I think that'll be... That'll be me for everything. Okay, cool. Ron, thank you so much for the super chat, man. You really are cool. I'd love to love to email correspond. It'd be nice to chat to you. Love, love the medical profession. Um, okay, so what I plan on doing, I'm not gonna pull up any more watches. Maybe what I can do is stop the, um, can we have a Sky Dweller versus GMT Master Tour? Brilliant, okay, I'm finalizing it. That's the last question for the evening. Perfect, great, great way to close off and we can, discuss that at length and then we can end the show it'll be nice okay sky dweller gmt just sky dweller and then just rolex gmt pepsi great way to close off the stream okay that's it no more suggestions from pieces uh guys thank you for joining in eric bell from sierra leone what a, that's awesome are you there on safari i'm guessing you're there for a trip that's too cool yeah i can't wait to uh to go holidaying again i'd love to go to kenya Botswana or Kenya and just have a cruise around, just hire out a, a vehicle and just go bundu bashing for a good few weeks. It'd be awesome. Check out the planes. Okay. 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 This is good. So we've got a whole list of pieces that we're going to run through before the end of the evening. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's cool. Okay, guys. Thank you. Everyone, I see lots of guys leaving and uh, thank you so much for joining if you are leaving. Uh, it's been really cool. I really didn't expect it to go, as, as, as always, never expect it to go fluidly, but then all of a sudden it does. And uh, the, the actual collaboration and communication between everyone, I think that's what makes the, the fun of it, you know, the fact that we can all just sit together and chat. Okay, everyone, awesome. I see a lot of you guys are on your way up, or oh, out, Zambia. Everyone's based in different places. Okay, let's start. I don't know who suggested this, <laughs> but... We're going to end off with a few of these pieces. The, uh, the AP Offshore. As an everyday wearing watch, you're very brave. You must have an amazing uh, set of forearms to take the weight. But then again, I know James from Founder Timeless Capital. His family loves wearing these pieces. And uh, it's, it's strange. I'm <clears throat> kind of on the fence with the Offshore compared to the, the standard Royal Oak. The idea behind the offshore was to make it look more modern and kind of approach the uh, the audience in that kind of way in the 90s. I think they, they brought on a 20-year-old to come in and design the watches and to, to modernize them in a way. And I would argue that the offshore line, these all these pieces, I think this is, geez, this is quite gorgeous, actually. The, um, the offshore line kind of perpetuated where the Royal Oak went because then we saw just how the chronographs became a thing and, and more popular. So for that reason, the, this, this offshore has perpetuated the design language of the, the entire Royal Oak line. 
which is something. And it's just them experimenting with new materials, new approaches. They're much more lax with regards to the materials they use, which I think is awesome. Uh, and for that reason, nice contrast. That's too cool. Uh, and I see a lot of you guys are leaving. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Mr. Perpetual, Brian, Shazbot, I don't know if Nasty Vinyl, great to have you on. I don't know if you just write discounts. Great to have you here. Um, okay. We're going to just close up on these last pieces. I see Ashmore saying, disengage, great show. <laughs> Drown the brown, see you next time. That's funny. Okay, so offshore, sick. I don't know who mentioned that they have this, this longer piece, but this is absolutely insane for a dress watch. The idea behind a dress watch, I think this really taps into the character of a dress watch in a way because... When you wear a dress watch, it's about restraint. It's about not knowing the running seconds. It's about, you know, being as uh, un, what, what's the best word? Un in the way, it needs to be simple, hidden. And for that reason, this watch really speaks. But at the same time, when you do look down at your wrist and you have this amazing starburst style, it keeps you engaged, you know? If you're in a boring conversation, you look at this thing and you just go, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. And I think that is that is the one thing that really pulls me to this piece. Um, it's kind of kitsch in a way when you think about it. It's you've got this bling factor, but at the same time, for a dress watch that is supposed to be relatively simple, just playing with a dial and, and the details on the dial to get this kind of effect and to, you know, emphasize that, oh, Beautiful. Lunga is, is amazing. I love their stuff. After handling a Lunga watch, I am sold. That's all I can say. Um, it's really an aspirational piece for me. Okay, so that's the Lunga going, going, and gone. Next, OP39. What needs to be said about this watch? As an everyday, I think this is an awesome watch to end the show on, actually. I see a lot of people leaving. <laughs> uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining once again. And there's, there's a correction. It's Rado, like in French. Okay, I think I'll have to <laughs> remember. Joe, thank you for joining. I'm sure everyone's everyone's gone by now, but it's cool. Uh, DB, thank you for joining. Okay, this piece just uh, really sings to the Rolex aesthetic, and this will tie in very nicely when we return to Skydweller versus GMT, which is what I hope to end the show with. Uh, LLD, thank you so much for joining. It's awesome having you here. Always bring up some insightful thoughts, and it's great. Um, so this watch keeps that Rolex DNA so well intact. It keeps the, uh, the legibility there, the contrast, the, the simple layout on the dial and everything. It's just superb. It's a tuxedo watch, but you can wear it every day. The white dial has a great appeal because it has that formality factor, but is also superb for an everyday wearing watch with jeans, a shirt. Um, for that reason, it's awesome. Also the bezel. The fact that the bezel is domed and not flat tapers down the visual presence of the watch on the wrist. It's a small little detail that isn't discussed often. Uh, when you have a, a, a domed bezel, visually it bounces the light and pulls the light in a bit more, making the watch look smaller on the wrist. Um, if it was me and I had the option between a white dial and a black dial, I would probably take white dial any day of the week just because it speaks more to that Rolex language. I think it has that that character that you want out of the watch. Awesome. Okay. I think most of the time is going to be spent debating the Skydweller and the GMT. Oh, this Holland and Holland is absolutely gorgeous. Love it. I mean, the way that the brown, and, and this is something that I could emphasize is, and I'm sure everyone's gone already, but hey, uh, design is not about just blowing the doors off all the time. Sometimes it's just about understanding color. It's about understanding contrast doesn't always need to be a thing. It can just be something as simple. Let's get a better picture up for you. It can be something just as simple as understanding that the dial needs to correspond with the strap, for example. You know, um, for that reason, this watch really does speak well. And and again, the the, the symmetry, the, the basic layout is superb. And this was made for Holland and Holland shotguns. They make beautifully fine crafted pieces. Um, Thomas Burnett, thank you so much for the super chat, man. You are a legend. I'm going to get back to you this weekend in our email. <laughs> the next decade we're going to have an awesome stream next weekend just before new year's we're going to have a chat about uh, a different subject which might be quite fun thank you so much again thomas you're awesome um really really cool and cheetown 
It's cool. Really, it's been so nice. The fact that people don't engage is great, actually, because I can just talk to myself, <laughs> as always. Uh, Dear Artifact, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, everyone, follow Dear Artifact on Instagram. It's got some awesome stuff. Really simple collection, but concise, well thought out. Okay, the Holland and Holland is gone. We're going to talk about the outsize date. I'm sure the guy who suggested it has left. Now, this, this speaks real typical longer through and through. I think the one just the one uh, thing that sort of divided me with this watch is the way that the twin batons have been set on it. I don't like it as much as just the standard simple batons uh, around the dial and the twin at the top. But the fact that everything is black makes it so like understated and cool and simple. Uh, love the big date. Love the just the stark contrast and legibility. It's also quite nice, depending on the light you're in, of course. As we are looking at it right now, very difficult to see the hands in this light. It's a bit of a problem. But uh, you can't go wrong with longer. This has a moon phase as well, sub-seconds. It's gorgeous, just gorgeous. And to close off the stream tonight, we're going to look at Sky Dweller versus GMT. And I can maybe elaborate a bit more on my thought on the piece. We looked at the Sky Dweller in the beginning of the show. And if you haven't seen the, the stream or the video that I put up yesterday, uh, discuss the Sky Dweller at length. And I call it a watchmaking masterclass. <laughs> Everyone else is joining in. It's nice to have you here. Thank you for joining, guys. We, we've been running the stream for two hours, and uh, uh, it's nice to have you on. I know you're from a different side of the world, and it's, it's so funny. Okay. So ending off with these two watches, the Sky Dweller versus the Pepsi GMT. What I really wanted to try and focus on in the video was questioning whether or not the Rolex GMT was the perfect watch for the time period. That's what I tried to make quite apparent in the beginning of the video. Um, and it's, it's quite a difficult thing. When we think about just the aesthetics of the time and what appealed to people, how that changed, um, and when the sports watch was introduced, was the sports watch the best choice fitted for the environment it was set in? And for me, in my... Uh, Humble opinion, I think the Sky Dweller better sort of addresses that time period of the, the, the early 50s or the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and what's so nice about this watch and what really hit me when, when I did the write-up and thought about it a bit more is that it's one of those pieces that really pays homage to what Rolex was like in that period, the, the late 50s, early 60s. And what they've done with regards to the complication, the simplicity, the balance on the dial, the, uh, the thought behind the, the complication where it was set, it's, it's questionable whether or not this subdial, in hindsight, whether or not the subdial is well set where it is and whether it should be better to just cover up all of these numerals and to keep the top three numerals. If, if Curtis is watching the show, I don't think he's watched the entire show. I think he suggested this to me in an email that I haven't read yet. <laughs> um, Covering up all of these numerals and just keeping the 20, 22, 24 open, just the top three, maybe cleans up the dial a bit more. But then maybe it's nice to have that complication on display. Um, and, and I've said in the very beginning of the stream, actually, we looked at this watch, that Curtis is an aviation pilot. He's an industrial designer, qualified. And uh, he's been flying for years and years. And this, this watch to him, after owning a 1675 for years, this watch to him really speaks to his, his needs and what he enjoys, uh, the aesthetics, the functional aspect really appeals to him. And uh, I find it fascinating. So comparing the two, it's kind of like comparing apples and oranges, really. Uh, I see everyone signing off. <laughs> I'm boring everyone. Uh, James, thank you so much for joining, uh, as always. Founder Time is Capitals, a legend. Um, everyone, thank you so much. And have a superb Christmas. I haven't even, I haven't even, mentioned that in the show pretty poor of me everyone's gonna have a good wednesday hey Cheetown says the sky dweller to me is the day date for this generation's international business exec yeah exactly it has that that modern draw still very kind of vintage inspired in nature but has that modern appeal that could reach out to a new generation it's a brilliant idea i mean it really is cool um and i mean you know it, it is quite masculine in the way it presents itself so that's that's something um, but I just I just find it fascinating comparing the two. 
this technically is the older watch it's got the the older heritage that the generational history i mean i love bex and makes does take some amazing photos look at that so for that reason you can't deny that this watch is very important to the history of these piece of, of rolex's line and everything else but it's kind of leaving you with that question of whether or not the sky dweller is is a very aspirational piece for the, the more executive person nowadays um ah, it's cool really nice i'm so glad that we were able to like kind of bring the discussion down so if you haven't seen uh the video from this week i go into more detail about the design of the watch and uh, focus i really I, it was a write-up so it's a lot more concise i focus on all the little elements love the highlights love the skeletonizing and again it's that it's that underlying theme of it being a homage to what the watches were like from the time before steel sports mania for that reason gets my nod of approval and then we go to the movements and the, the complication itself no pinhole adjustments nothing like that that is also so appealing the watch still is a rolex you can throw it in the water you can wear it every day no worries and all of that complication how is it inside the watch it's too cool so for the first time we've actually kind of been quite concise with the show it's quite impressive so i've stopped sharing the screen i think we're gonna we'll eventually close off but um yeah you guys are you guys are awesome i love love the dialogue i love our conversations that we have always makes the show so much fun for me especially i hope you manage to enjoy it and it's uh it's a bit unorthodox but i mean it's nice being strange and different <laughs> subdial on the sky dweller is a significant part of the what what makes it attractive yeah it is it is the pretty much the highlight of the piece um, I think they did a much better job keeping the, the the dial matching with the wheel. I mentioned that in the video. I think the white dial kind of broke up the watch a bit too much visually. Um, Chitan says, the Sky, the Sky Dweller is Rolex admitting that the passenger in first class is more likely to go to wear one of their watches than pilots are. Yeah, yeah very true. Um, it's a really interesting, it's still, it's still got me thinking. It would be nice to do a bit more of a, a retrospective. I'd actually like to run some retrospective uh, thoughts on various pieces in the future. So hope to do that. But, uh, you know, time, if time allows me. Got a really cool video coming up that I hope you guys are going to enjoy. Jumping back into the history of military watches. I'll go so far to say that. Um, halfway through it already. Very hard finding, like, the history and the references that I'm looking for. But it's going to be really nice. A nice contrast to the first episode of the series. I'll say that much. To the 144 of you watching, it's going to be a really cool video coming out. Um, and we're going across the channel to a certain part of the continent and discussing their watches in military history. It should be very cool. But uh, really, thank you all so much for joining. Eric, that is awesome. I'm, it's so cool that you're in Sierra Leone at the moment. Uh, it's a part of Africa I'd love to see. Love to go further north. And LLD, best watch chat on YouTube. Oh, man, you're a legend. No, I mean, I'm just a normal, everyday guy. I love chatting about watches. We're all in this for the same thing. We love this. And uh, we just enjoy the hobby, the, the concept and the approach and the thought. And, I mean, there's so much to think about when we talk about pieces. Um, and, again, now that I have some time in my hands over January, I hope to do a lot more write-ups. I've got about four or five in the works at the moment and uh, should be a lot of fun. I'm going to look into Breguet. I've got, I've got one coming up about ridiculous Rolex auctions and that should be funny. Um, I'm looking at like Paul Newman's Daytona and contrasting it to the most ridiculous Submariner auction I've ever seen. <laughs> it should be very funny because it's a very divided uh, topic. Reed Cruikshank, thank you. I, I've seen you in the chat tonight and I haven't... Uh, haven't mentioned you apologies there's so much stuff going on i can't see half the stuff going on, on the screen now that i'm actually watching the chat it's pretty cool um Chitam, you're always here and it's it's a pleasure it really is a pleasure talking about this with all of you um functional doc design drawings i'd love to i'd love to actually spend more time making videos about watch design um, but at the same time it's a very niche subject it's nice but as much, I mean, it's, it's the thought behind the effort that goes into the videos. If a video takes 10 hours to prepare and is only seen by like a thousand people, it's kind of a, a kick in the, in the nether regions, you know? <laughs> um, 
Churchill's date just that should be quite cool as well. T-Town, awesome. Thomas Burnett is still <laughs> uh, Thomas Burnett still jumping between. That's awesome. Great having you here, man. Really, and I didn't wish you a merry Christmas. I really hope you have a superb week next week. Everyone who's watching at the moment, um, I plan on taking it really slowly, just enjoying this time off, putting my feet up, and going to stick to more writing. I want to get back into writing about watches and really try and drive. It's actually, it's ridiculous. My channel is now sitting at almost 20,000 subscribers and that is just freaking unreal. The fact that I've never asked for subscribers is just as cool, actually. Um, uh, I've really tried my best to, to hone in on focusing on a subject and whether you like it or not, you can stay, you can go. And I think that's important. I really don't like guilting people into watching stuff. Um, yeah, it was cool. And DB talking about the North flag. Yeah, I mean, I can't even remember half these videos. I think just over the last few months, I've made like over 100 videos in general. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I think I added crown guards to it and I moved the, the sub dial, the, the power reserve around. Um, oh, there's so much. I, I think in future, I do want to focus more on the design of watches if I can. I think what made the channel quite interesting in the beginning, which I actually really want to hone in on, is um, focusing more on adjusting a few areas if they deserve it, you know? Um, nice idea. And functional dock, more designs of other projects, not just watches. It's a good idea. I really want 2020 to be a creative year, if possible. So uh, that'll be something in the works as well. But really, every everyone, thank you. I see Eaton711. It's a pleasure. It is an absolute pleasure. I love doing this. I love the hobby. I love reaching out, chatting to people, sharing what little stuff I know about design. <laughs> it's it's really a joy. And uh, this the live streams to me is a point when I can sit back, chat to you all, and uh, engage. I think the community is so important behind this because it's, it's not just about sharing your perspective. It's also about hearing insights. I want at the beginning of the stream, as you might see later, to be focused on what everyone has been wearing. And uh, for that reason, it's great hearing what everyone enjoys, what appeals to them. I love the fact that we're all different in this space. Yeah, that's awesome. Guys, thank you so much for the show. Uh, it really is a pleasure. Have a superb Christmas once again. And I will see you in the next one. Cheers for now.